the May 3rd meeting of the Cary Town Council. Uh, we have two of our council members out this evening. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bush and Council Member Jennifer Robinson are both attending conferences on behalf of the town. So to start our meeting, I'm going to recognize Council Member Smith, who will do our ceremonial opening. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have one change on our agenda this evening. Following the presentation of the Building Safety Month proclamation, we need to add the presentation from the Kids Together organization. Is there a motion to adopt the amended agenda? So moved as amended. Second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Takes us to recognitions, reports, and presentations. Before we get started, we have two troops, uh, Boy Scouts in the audience, Troop 213 and 31, both working on citizenship in the community. Uh, badges, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you so much for being here. Okay, our first uh, recognition report presentation is Bike Presentation Month. Um, and I'll invite Councilmember France to meet Greg Couch on behalf of Northwoods Elementary PTA. Well, it's my honor to recognize May, 8, May 2018 as Bike Month and celebrating the Town of Cary's commitment to complete streets principles. Originally, Council Member Lori Bush, who we all know is an avid cyclist, was going to be here to present this tonight, but as the mayor mentioned, she's out of town on town business. So I get the honor to present the uh, proclamation because this is something I have been incredibly passionate about for like the last two and a half weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I actually, I went out and bought a bike, <laughs> and for the last two and a half weeks, I have been riding my bike to work, to town hall, running errands all throughout the community. I have already logged about 40, 45 miles on my bike so far, so uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I feel better. Uh, I would encourage anybody else who's not riding a bike to go out and get one and start pedaling. The weather is great. It's fun, and I've enjoyed it tremendously meeting people along the way. It's just been a lot of fun. Um, so w there's a lot of whereas's in this one, so bear with me, but um, whereas today millions of Americans engage in bicycling for fun, fitness, sport, recreation, and transportation, and whereas the town of Cary has been a nationally recognized bicycle-friendly community by the League of American Bicycli Bicyclists since 2003, and whereas the town of Cary will be an active participant in nationally recognized events including Bike to School Day, Bike to Work Day, and National Trails Day, and whereas the term complete streets describes a comprehensive transportation network that allows safe and convenient mobility for users of all ages and abilities, including bicyclists and pedestrians, and whereas a transportation system that includes complete streets is conductive to streets that are active with people walking and bicycling to everyday destinations, such as schools, shops, parks, transit, and jobs, which in turn enhances neighborhood economic vitality and livability, and whereas complete streets encourage an active lifestyle by creating opportunities to integrate exercise into daily activities, thereby improving the health of the community. And whereas complete street principles have been integrated into transportation planning in Cary since 2001 and are incorporated throughout all chapters of the Imagine Cary Community Plan. Now, therefore, I, Don France, on behalf of Harold Weinbrecht, Jr., Mayor of the Town of Cary, North Carolina, and on behalf of the entire Cary Town Council, do hereby recognize our commitment to complete streets principles and proclaim May 2018 as Bike Month in Cary. Proclaim this third day, May 2018. Um, I just wanted to say real quick, thank you, Don. Um, on behalf of our school, Northwoods Elementary, as well as the other four Cary schools, who will be participating in next week's National Bike to School Day celebration. 
We would like to thank the town for its ongoing efforts in helping to make Cary a bicycle-friendly community. And I would especially like to thank all the men and women who work to keep our streets, our greenways, and our parks safe and so well-maintained. They are vital in allowing us the ability to offer events such as Bike School Day to our students. So thank you again, and we hope to see lots of folks out riding their bikes this month, especially if you have a brand new bike. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm going to jump in here for a minute and uh, just uh, share with folks a little uh, story here. The last two weeks we've been blessed to have with our sister cities, both uh, a delegation from France and a delegation uh, from Ireland. And the groups from Ireland had avid uh, cyclists, and uh, we, we made sure that they had some time to um, ride and experience um, our greenways and all the things about. But here's the deal. They have a major cycling event every year that draws thousands and thousands of cyclists from all over the world. And they've challenged us to start thinking about being part of that event. So the gauntlet is out there. Uh, you wanna find out more, you probably won't find anything yet on Sister Cities of Cary, but you just check in and watch for announcements. We're gonna try to get those dates out. And I, I hope by 2020, I think it's too late for 2019, but I hope by 2020 we get to take a cycling team over there, maybe led by Lori. Or Don. Don. <laughs> and Don. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I would invite uh, all the people watching and all the people in the audience to uh, participate in one of the bike events this uh, month. There are several of them. I know I'm participating in one on Saturday where I think we're going from White Oak Park to... Uh, Fest in the West, that's right. So, short uh, bike ride, but it should be a lot of fun. All right, we move on to our second presentation. This one is for Building Safety Month, and I would invite uh, Inspections and Permits Director Ken Hawley, along with Electrical Plans Examiner Regina Singleton Williams, and Deputy Commissioner of North Carolina Department of Insurance Cliff Isaac, to meet me at the podium. These guys keep, our, keep us safe, and it's very important that our buildings are safe. I want to live in somewhere that's safe, and I want to visit places that are, some, that are safe. And so to honor them, to honor what they do, and to recognize this month as Building Safety Month, I would like to read a proclamation. Whereas the town of Cary is committed to recognizing that, all our, that our growth and strength depends on the safety and economic value of the homes, building, buildings and infrastructure that serve our citizens both in everyday life and in times of natural disaster. And whereas our competence and structural integrity of these buildings that make up our community is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, laborers, and others in the construction industry who work year-round to ensure the safe construction of buildings, and whereas building codes save lives is the theme for Building Safety Month in 2018, encourages all Americans to raise awareness of the importance of safe building construction, fire prevention, disaster mitigation, and recognizes that countless lives have been saved due to the implementation of safety codes by local and state agencies, whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, Americans are asked to consider the commitment to improve building safety and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local and state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, and federal <coughs> agencies in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, I, Harold Weinberg, Jr., Mayor of the Town of Cary, North Carolina, on behalf of the Town of Cary and its Council, do hereby proclaim May 2018 as Building Safety Month in the Town of Cary, and I encourage all of our citizens to join with other communities in participating in Building Safety Month activities. Furthermore, 
We <laughs> applaud all Town of Cary staff that play a role in building safety. We extend our appreciation to them for enhancing the quality of life of all Cary citizens by providing health, safety, and welfare. Proclaim this third day of May, 2018. Council, on behalf of our staff, I would like to accept this proclamation and thank you for your continued support of building safety. Uh, during the month of May, our staff has set up uh, building safety displays at both Town Hall as well as the Cary Senior Center, and we will be out in the community <coughs> interacting with our contractors and citizens at local home improvement stores as well as attending the Best in the West event <coughs> coming Saturday. Uh, this year's theme is Building Code Saved Lives, but effective building codes require partnerships uh, and tonight I'd like to highlight the partnership between the Town of Cary Code Officials and the North Carolina Department of Insurance. Uh, representing our Code Officials is Regina Singleton-Williams. Regina is a graduate of North Carolina State University and earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Regina is a state certified level three electrical and plumbing code official and was hired as our first plans examiner in 1990. She is one of our longest tenured Code Officials. Uh, we celebrated her 28th year anniversary with the Town of Cary yesterday. Uh, and uh, we estimate that she has completed over 30,000 plan reviews in her Cary career so far. Wow. <laughs> Regina is a technical expert with a calm presence, a mentor to code officials. She keeps me in line every day, <laughs> and I appreciate her career-long devotion to building and life safety. Uh, representing the North Carolina Department of Insurance is Cliff Isaac. Cliff is a professional engineer and has been with the North Carolina Department of Insurance for one year in his current role. And I specifically asked Cliff to attend tonight because in my judgment, we are experiencing unprecedented support and collaboration at the state level with the North Carolina Department of Insurance. Uh, in the last year, Department of Insurance staff has visited 50 building departments throughout the state to determine what's working well and challenges. And this staff has visited Cary on three occasions and accompanied our code officials on many inspections. Uh, specifically, Cliff uh, routinely appears before the North Carolina Legislature and the Building Code Council on code-related topics and always seeks the input of the local code officials first. We get greatly appreciate the support we're receiving from Cliff and the North Carolina Department of Insurance. In closing, building safety is a cornerstone of a great community, and we thank the Council for your continued support and this recognition. I'd like to thank both Regina and Cliff for being here with me tonight to accept this proclamation and for what they do every day to ensure building safety. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Commissioner of Insurance and the Department of Insurance, I am pleased of all the good work that the Town of Cary and its code enforcement officials are doing to make buildings and structures safe. <coughs> Safety is job one. Congratulations. Mr. Isaacs, thank you for being here, and thanks. please send our thanks to all the staff members who are involved in keeping us safe, whether we're at home or at work, and whatever we do. That's very important. Like you said, it's a priority. The safety is a priority. So thank you all very much for all you do. All right, I'm not going to leave up here. We've got more to do. So at the beginning of the meeting, we added an item. Uh, it's the Marla Durrell uh, Kids Together, and uh, she's going to make a special presentation today. So I would invite Marla Durrell up to the podium. And for those that don't remember, Marla was a longtime council member, was here eight years, and knows us all and is a good friend, and we miss her. Oh, thank you. Uh, Marla uh, and the Kids Together board have been working on a project for a long, long time, and they've been saving up money. And uh, if, if you haven't been to Marla Durrell Park, it's a very special park. It's different from other parks because it provides the opportunity for children with all ranges of physical and mental abilities to have a great time and enjoy themselves in a public environment. And it's such a great place and a fun place to be. So we're excited about the announcement that you're going to make this evening. Great. Well, thank you, Mayor, and welcome, Council. Uh, so nice to see you and be with you again. Uh, I also have with me tonight Bruce Brown, 
Now, I think of Bruce as the daddy of the playground because Bruce is the one who had originally brought the idea of an accessible playground in Cary to the town. And he and I have been uh, doing kids together for about 25 years. And we also have some of our Kids Together board members here tonight. I'd just act like to ask them to stand. We'll go back here. hard-working bunch, I can tell you that. So we're here this evening, as the mayor said, for Kids Together, the all-volunteer nonprofit organization that supports that special place to play, Carrie's Kids Together Playground. We're bringing a gift to the town as your partner in the newest addition to the playground, the Enchanted Misting Garden. But first, let's take a look back. 24 years ago, I received a call from an eight-year-old girl asking me which bank to go to to get one of those really big checks. Now, you see, she and her friend were the dynamic duo Kristen Holcomb and Helen Riddlemeyer, and they and their friends had begun raising funds for an accessible playground in Cary. They wanted to present their check to the town, much as we're doing tonight. Although I will say, I don't have to stand on a chair to do it. They did. The ch that check they gave was for $1,322.08, and it was all raised by kids. And that planted the seeds for the organization that would become Kids Together. The playground opened in 2000, with Kids Together giving nearly $300,000 toward the project, about 30% of the total cost. Since then, we have contributed shade structures, an engraved granite map at the entrance, and a management manual to assist the town's awesome public works staff. We turned our attention then to an important playground element that had been set aside, and that was a water feature. So six years ago, Kids Together funded the development of schematic plans to help us begin actively fundraising for this project. And then we went to work. Each year, the proceeds from our annual Walk, Run, and Roll for Inclusiveness brought more into the fund, and the Lazy Days Festival Committee generously supported our effort with multiple grants, and our board volunteered each year with La Farm Bakery at Spring Days and Lazy Days to earn part of their day's proceeds. That was very generous of them to share with us, and our misting fund grew every year. We're grateful to our major donors, the Paul Zebgolis family, Phyllis Eller Moffat, and bb and And we were really touched when friends of Martha Riddlemeyer, the sister of Helen Riddlemeyer, and her family honored her memory with gifts to the Misting Garden. Every day donation, every whether large or small, brought us to this day. But you know, we all know that this gift is not really about the money. It's not really about that. It's about our community saying, we love Kids Together Playground, and we want to see it continue to be the very best place for all children to play together. It's about our understanding that you have lots of parks to support, not just this one, even though it is our favorite. And it's about continuing our partnership to keep Kids Together Playground a national model for inclusive, accessible play. We're really excited about the Misting Garden, which now I call the Enchanted Misting Garden because of the mystifying bronze chimeras, that's animal mashups, brought to the project by Asheville sculptor Todd Fromm. Wait till you see her. And then just a quick but well-earned thank you to town staff member Amy McIntosh, who's leading construction of the project, and Denise Dickens, who led the artist selection process and provides the public art interface. And of course, we owe our greatest thanks to you, the town of Cary, for being the partner that saw the value of continuing to invest in this very special place where all children can play. So here's the latest on the project, along with an invitation to you and everyone who likes to play. We expect the installation to be completed in a matter of days, probably about a week and a half, we think. When we know for sure, we'll invite everyone at the last minute to come to the big reveal where we will unveil our new Chimera friends. Then our second and official celebration will take place on Sunday, June 3rd, 
3 p.m. when we turn on the water and play in the mist. Oh, yes, we brought a gift. Uh, let's see, Mayor, I think we need to present this to you. Okay. We have a big check. All right. For those that can't okay. read the big print, $46,000. item under recognitions and reports and presentations is the town manager's updates. I'll recognize Manager Stiegel at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, please present to you uh, this evening the 2019 recommended or proposed budget for your consideration. Uh, it's, a, it's a budget that rec reflects an organization that is uh, very much in flux, but one that is still providing and positioned to provide through this budget uh, the high level of services that our citizens have come to enjoy. Um, as a reminder to the council, uh, our budget is no longer event, an event-driven process where we will meet uh, on it uh, throughout the year and continue to update it. And, and we now have another $46,000 in revenue, which uh, points out the fact that the minutes is printed is already out of date. Um, the, uh, there's some key priorities there uh, for, for the town council to consider and look forward uh, in having further discussions on approximately $1.8 million in unallocated funds allow the council to engage and kind of provide some direction on priorities during the process. We will uh, release it to the to the public uh, late on Monday evening and then we'll have our first discussion on at the quarterly meeting on May 10th and work through work sessions through June 7th so there's plenty of time in there to um, answer questions from the citizens from the council and continue those deliberations. So thank you. Thank you Mr. Stegall. All right we'll move to our next item public speaks out. We've included instructions for speaking at Public Speaks Out on the printed agenda. And if you'd like to speak at Public Speaks Out, I would ask that you take a seat in the rows to my right that are reserved and follow the instructions on the printed agenda. Public Speaks Out speakers have three minutes for their comments and speakers may speak on any topic unless it's a public hearing. The public hearing uh, speakers have five minutes instead of three, so that works to your benefit. The three-minute time limit will be enforced, not to be rude, but to be fair to all of our speakers. There's a timer on the podium, and when the green light turns into a yellow light, that means you have 30 seconds remaining, and when the yellow light turns into a flashing red light, that's the point I will interrupt you, again, not trying to be rude, but trying to be fair to all of our speakers. And uh, we have... We want to have a very efficient Public Speaks Out meeting. If you're here with a group, we ask that you have a spokesperson speak on behalf of the group to reduce repetitive <coughs> comments. We also would like the uh, speaker after NFC, it's already happening, the next speaker to be in line ready to speak and because we have a one hour time limit. So we wanna make sure everybody gets their opportunity to speak. I thank everyone in the audience for understanding that this is a business meeting. Please do not applaud, make remarks from your seats, or anything else that may distract from the meeting. So now's the time for Public Speaks Out, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Yes, sir. <coughs> Look to Good your evening. left, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Batterson. I live in Winbrook, uh, the adjacent property to REZ. 17 REZ 12, and I'd like to speak on two topics, both related, both related to erosion. The first is the erosion of the 24 plan, 2020, 2040 plan, which was a, a vision of what Cary ought to be like. It was a vision of a place where people could live, shop, play, pray, 
visit their doctors all within the same community without having to go to Raleigh or Durham or to Research Triangle. What's happening is I see an erosion of property that is non-residential. I've seen it in the Singh property. I've seen it uh, at, at many different things. It's only been about a year since this plan was adopted and already this plan is eroding. And it's going to erode further when REZ uh, 12 uh, is approved for an additional 43 units. The second issue on erosion is the property itself. The plan itself is a property that's on a very steep hill. There's a stream running at the bottom of it. The hill is covered with trees so that the runoff is not so great yet. Once they start cutting down the trees and building impermeable surfaces, the runoff will go into the stream. They have a plan for a holding pond, but the holding pond is up the hill from the stream. I asked them how they were going to get the water to flow from the bottom of the hill, uphill, into the holding pond, and they told, it, told me not to worry because it was required by law. The water doesn't know it's required to flow uphill by law. I think this plan needs to be reviewed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Dolan. I'm the owner of 118 Winburn Drive, and I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts uh, on the 17 REZ 12 uh, Silverton Amendment. Um, as my neighbor mentioned, in the first section of the Cary 2040 plan the council adopted in 2017, it states the purpose of the plan is to articulate the town's vision and values and set a course for achieving Cary's desired future. So tonight, you will make a decision that will have a lasting impact on our community. Do you follow the vision of that plan, leaving that, that site zoned as office and, and institutional so it can be land for economic development? Or do you rezone it for high-density high residential where there's already a saturation of housing units? When that ground is lost, it's gone forever. When I think about the town I want to live in and I want to keep living in, it, it's a place where people live and work. So I think about the council meeting on June 8th last year, and Councilman Yurha, you stated that this zoning request is a perfect case for the planning and zoning board to review. So deciding that that zoning change fits the Cary 2040 plan, should it stay designated, or should it be changed to high density, density residential? And as you're aware, at the August 21st planning and zoning board meeting, this rezoning request was discussed and that board decided to deny the request. The chair of the planning board stated that we members of the board have an obligation to the town of Cary must preserve office space for the future. I commend the planning board chair as he recognized that this land is needed for long-term job creation. Based on the analysis of the town's planning staff, they made a pre preliminary recommendation that the rezoning request for approval for parcel H but also recognize that by making the change, it would represent a loss of land, a currently designated for office and institutional, and that a portion of that is already adjacent to existing employment and mixed use campus, the North Carolina Dental Society and Primrose Daycare. According to the staff report, if offices are built on this land, that could support up to 254 employees, but by changing it to residential, that land would be removed and it decreases the possibility of economic development of that site and for people to live and work in the town. Can we afford to lose that land as a site for economic development? Again, I thank you for your time and consideration of this issue and I'd ask that you reject that amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Sarah Duff, this is my son Henry. He's very excited to talk to you this evening. Um, I am also a resident of Winbrook and I would like to speak to you about 17 REZ 12. The 5.58 acres being considered for rezoning is pictured on page 36 of the handouts you're receiving under the work section of the Cary 2040 plan where it is listed as prime office space. This designation was given by the planning staff after discussions with the Cherry, Cary Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Committee. A copy of page 36 has been provided, so you would see the map and the narrative that describes the shrinking office space available in Cary, and that this remaining office space should be preserved for economic development. From the Cary 2040 plan, I'd like to read, as the town grows, 
It is critical to monitor and protect these prime sites for future employment growth and business recruitment and not convert them to residential or commercial uses. I implore you to hold to the CARI 2040 plan and think about future generations, this guy right here, and where they will work, not just where they will live. The decision tonight is to grant the rezoning request for high density residential. The possibility for economic development is gone. The possibility of the potential employees is gone. The possibility for the potential reinvestment in the community to support local restaurant or retail, it's gone. Once it's gone, it can never be replaced. A decision to grant the rezoning request will result in loss to the Cary economy in the long term. But here we are, just over a year since the Cary Community 2040 plan was adopted, and you must decide whether or not to delete this 5.58 acres from the potential for economic development. This is especially important since the Walton Wood properties were approved at the opposite corner of Cary Parkway and Evans Road, which resulted in a loss of more than 22 plus acres that had been designated office and institutional and a loss of 19 acres of ground rezoned or zoned for retail. Since the Walton Wood properties are intergenerational and geared to seniors, this 5.58 acres would be ideal for a comprehensive medical complex, which is much needed in North Cary and would provide highly skilled high wage jobs. This is also a great location for startup businesses or legal offices. We realize that it's your duty to decide if the purposed rezoning fits the use of the ground and you can't dictate what is built on the property as long as the construction follows town codes and ordinances. At the June 8 council meeting, it was mentioned that this property has been on the market for 30 years as office space and no one has been interested. However, now that the ground available for office is dwindling in the town of Cary, this may be the time that someone steps up to develop offices. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, council. <coughs> My name is Lloyd Handy. I'm also a resident at Winbrook. Uh, traffic is one of our major concerns for everyone who uses Evans Road. With the approval of the Walton Wood project at the corner of Evans and Cary Parkway, there will be 896 new residential units between the entrance of our development and Aviation Parkway about two miles down the road. These units will have at least one car, possibly two, in the case with assisting living units, there will be staff cars adding to, all the existing traffic that is now dumping onto Evans Road. Winbrook only has one ingress and one egress, which is Winburn Drive, connecting directly to Evans Road. Making a left-hand turn onto Evans Road is difficult by the owners right now. Owners usually plan the doctor's appointments, uh, the shopping, during the middle part of the day. Uh, when traffic is not as bad. Now that the Walton Wood properties have been approved, traffic will be even more difficult. Specific to the project being considered this evening at, the town, at this town occurring meeting, was on last, uh, June 8th last year, Jim Compton, the engineer at ESP for the developer, stated that the office building could generate 800 to 1,300 trips per day and with a residential complex would only generate 235 trips per day. However, our mayor, Weinbrecht, refuted this data by pointing out that these numbers are ag aggregate numbers and do not take into account the time of day and which day of the week that the trips are made. He stated that the residential traffic, the trips are spread out over a 24 hour, seven day a week. The concentration of traffic from offices would be morning, evening, and possibly a little at lunchtime. That would be much more traffic, much less traffic on, from the offices on the weekends. We ask that you keep the vision of the Cary 2040 plan and leave this property as office and institutional. After all the time invested in putting together the Cary 2040 community plan, it would be a huge disappointment to those of us who trusted the office and institutional designation in the 2440 plan would remain that way. Why change the zoning tonight 
to a high density residential for a town home project that is not needed, does not generate any excitement, and would only add to the traffic on Evans Road. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. since this site is already zoned office institutional, an office, an office developer would not have to offer any of the conditions offered by the Shenandoah developer. An office developer would not have to have to have a neighborhood meeting to get input from neighbors. However, a neighborhood meeting was held on February 13 this year at the request of Mark Ward of Shenandoah. A PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation was given to show conceptual sketches of possible elevation of townhomes, the gathering space, and the possibility of office buildings. And a booklet was also handed out these sketches. If you please will refer to the handout that was just provided, please, no please note the top illustration. The top illustration <coughs> was, was prepared by ESP, the engineering firm that represents Shenandoah. This is what appears in the booklet that was handed out. It shows a parking lot between Winbrook and a potential office building that Mr. Ward developer stated was 50 foot high. The building is, is 55 stories plus a roof, so it appears much taller than 50 foot high on this drawing. The next two illustrations were cut and pasted to make the following points. The middle illustration is close to what appeared in the PowerPoint presentation at the neighborhood meeting on February 13, and that was what's shown to those of us that attended the meeting. It shows a huge 50-foot building very close to the property line looming over the townhouse of Windbrook. When questioned by email dated February 15, Mr. Ward acknowledged that an error was made. Those with us attended the neighborhood cannot unsee what presented. It made the impression of fear in the future building possibility of the site, we believe the introduction of fear was that was done intentional. We realize that the placement of building is not under con consideration tonight, but the bottom illustration, which you see, shows a logical placement of a placement of a, lo a lo of a tall office building close to the existing office campus of North Carolina Dental Society, much less threatening. And the conclusion is a normal placed commercial building or a, a, a medical building is not such a threat. Let's leave it at that, please. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, my name is Lee Creighton. I can't believe I'm just now learning that we have a French sister city. Uh, they're in Montreuil-sur-Mer on Pas-de-Calais. It's a beautiful part of the country. I can't wait to go, but I am here tonight to speak on 17 Res 12. Ideally, I think Cary should be a town where we not only live, but where we work, where we play, where we raise families. Uh, and residents currently drive to other areas of the triangle, and then they leave their money in those other areas of the triangle. They buy lunch, they buy gas, they spend their money on the way while they're there and on the way back. Uh, based on the planning report, I see that this site could support between 152 and 254 employees. The planning staff report also states a concern identified in the work policy of the Cary 2040 plan. I'm quoting here, the parcels that have been rezoned in this area have been almost exclusively rezoned for residential use. Now in checking the rezoning requests over the last several years, there were 22 cases that asked for changes from O&I or R40 to multifamily or mixed use. Of these 22 cases, 14 uh, were for multifamily or townhouses. That's 65%, that's two thirds of the requests going to multifamily. In these cases, O&I lost 28.7 acres 
that could have been used for economic development. Can we afford to lose more, is my question. Even if it's only you know, five and a half acres, it's prime office space. And uh, there's a lot of long-term permanent jobs that we could uh, have that use that space. Uh, there are various members of the Planning and Zoning Board that have also made comments uh, that I find revealing. Uh, for example, acknowledging the importance of retaining property for office development. Land for offices is a precious commodity. Changing this ONI designation would mean a loss of any opportunity for economic development in the future. I find that very important. Anything new should fit within the vision of the Cary 2040 plan, and I'm not sure that this does. A project that compels them to want to change the zoning from ONI to high density residential should be carefully considered. We shouldn't be squeezing as much as possible into the land. I believe the term shoehorned was used by one of the council members. Uh, and as a member of the council stated that in order to give up ONI, this project has got to blow him away, and I'm gonna ask if this project really does that for you. What moves you more, foraging, uh, foregoing long-term permanent jobs for residential development or working to ensure that our families and children have high-paying jobs in the town where we live? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Gronke, and this is my first time showing up to one of these things. Uh, I've lived here for about 25 years. I didn't think there'd be so many people here, so I'm kind of nervous, so I'll just wing it. Here it goes. Um, Councilmember France, I took my first car to your uh, shop. I've been taking my cars there ever since. Uh, it's a great shop. Mayor Weinbrock, they've ran a couple of 5Ks with you, so I'm well acquainted with the town. Um, I decided to come here because it's bike week, uh, or bike month, and I am a frequent cyclist. Um, and I've contacted the town a number of, number of times over the years uh, regarding um, improvements to the roads to make them more friendly to cyclists. Um, Currently, I know we have a lot of uh, sharrows and widened lanes and uh, things like that. And, um, uh, okay, uh, sharrows, widened lanes, things like that on Maynard Road and other roads. Um, but frankly, I don't think that's enough. Um, I know I read your um, town report about the uh, traffic improvements, and you noted that uh, not a lot of cyclists use a lot of the major roads. It's just for the serious commuters. Um, but uh, a lot of the reasons that we don't use those roads is because it's actually kind of scary to bike on those roads. Um, I've had a number of close calls with cars. Um, I don't think the sharrows do their job. Um, I see a lot of drivers, especially on roads like Maynard, just driving right over the sharrows. They're not leaving the lane. Uh, so I think that the big fix to that, and I know this is something that might take a while to get going, but the big fix is to add painted bike lanes to all of the major roads. Uh, this is something I've wanted for a while. I know it would take a lot of political capital, a lot of funding, and construction time to get that to happen. But I really feel like with that infrastructure, you would see a lot of people use those major roads, especially roads like Maynard, Cary Parkway. I mean, that's it's taking your life in your hands if you go on a bike in Cary Parkway. So, um, you know, I don't know. That's just what I think should happen. Um, I think once you make those improvements, uh, you'll see a lot of cyclists coming out to use those roads, uh, me included. I use it uh, the roads a lot to go back and forth uh, from different areas, and so, um, do what you guys can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kong. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor and Town Council. I'm Karen Ringe. I'm here today on behalf of the citizen organization Wake Up Wake County. Uh, Wake Up is a, uh, an advocate for planning for growth. We recognize that Wake County is the second fastest growing county in the country and uh, the decisions we make today will impact us all for tomorrow. Wake Up follows issues and advocates on issues including transportation, which is why I'm here tonight, uh, drinking water, public schools, and affordable housing. We wanted to say, commend you for proclaiming this as Bike Month, uh, and um, Councillor France, I'm very impressed with your new excitement about biking. Uh, but, um, and we're also excited about Bike to School Day, which is next week. We are working on uh, promoting safe routes to schools. And that's why we're also very pleased that you are really recognizing the importance of complete streets transportation policies. That's something that we're hoping every town will follow your lead and Raleigh's lead in doing. Uh, because as you know, complete streets means providing roads for all modes of, providing roads for all modes of transportation and increasing safety for pedestrians and cyclists 
as well as promoting public transit, which is something we all, and I know this council supports as we're moving forward with the Wake County Transit Plan. Um, we, um, and, and because we're growing so fast, we also recognize that having complete streets transportation policies is particularly important because we're making decisions um, to move a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And the kinds of roads we build means um, will impact um, the building around them as well, and as well as improving public safety. The, um, I also wanted to mention that I recognize that the Complete Streets policy is a part of Cary's community plan, which we're really pleased to see. I think that's a great step forward and, and sets a vision for the future. I think the previous speaker's remarks were well taken, and, and we hope that you won't just rest on your policy, but actually look at how you can continue to improve it to increase public safety, because we actually want more people biking and walking and taking public transit than we have today. Um, one additional step that we urge you to make, um, and though the budget, since the budget is a living document, I'm going to make my appeal right now for your um, budget for this year. For the past few years, you've been appropriating a million dollars a year for sidewalk improvements, which we, which is great, but it's not enough. Um, we'd really like to see you increase that funding as we move forward, and perhaps put in some additional money for bike striping as well. So we hope you'll take that into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. There. My name is Sarah Mers, and I'm here as Director of Advocates for Health in Action, or AHA for short, and our mission is to improve health in Wake County. In the past, we focused on, on healthy eating, physical activity, and now the well-being and ACEs work has become a big part of AHA's work and mission. You guys have been doing really a lot on that, so thank you. Um, and really, I'm here to thank you prompted by your bike proclamation. So thank you for doing that. And um, you know, both Wake Up and AHA have been working together uh, with the UNC Highway Safety Research Group, as well as the John Rex Endowment and the school system. And so we have been meeting with your staff and some other municipal staff. Your staff are just fantastic. Thank you. And the Imagine Carry plan that you put together and the emphasis on complete streets, um, this policy and practice is really fantastic. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and in particular, my organization's interest in this is health. And my personal interest is quality of life, and it just feels good, right? But uh, we know that when people can walk and bike to places, like not just when you go exercise, but when you can walk and bike to destinations, um, you do it more, and it is much easier to get some daily exercise in. You know, something like two-thirds of grown-ups don't even get the minimum recommended 30 minutes a day of physical activity, and on days when I don't have an opportunity to walk, like, sometimes I have trouble with that, too. So everything you're doing around walking and biking is really supporting health and happiness of your residents, so thank you for doing that. And tied into that, you know, AHA does these school health awards every year. And we've got a tour to go see the winning schools at the end of next week. And the winning schools are not public, but I will tell you that again, as in last year's, we will be in Cary. So just FYI, we'll just tell you more about that later. And then again, the work you guys are doing on ACEs and resilience is fantastic. Um, one of my board members on the AHA board is a Parks and Rec staff person in Cary, and I know he's been having a lot of conversations, and you all have been, and you just did a screening, um, what, two nights ago again, of a film called Resilience about adverse childhood experiences, childhood trauma, and the impact that has on long-term health and social outcomes. So. For people who haven't heard about that before, the awesome thing is there's great information and there are things we can do and there are communities leading on it. So thank you for everything. Really thank appreciate you. being here. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Adina Lev, and I live back in the green level. And I'm calling, I'm talking about 18 Rezo 1. If anybody's familiar with the green level, it's huge, it's forested. It used to be forested. On green level right now, there so, are... So I'm going to stop you. That's a public hearing. We'll call on you first. Tell me your last name. Lev. 
L L E V. L E V. Okay. So I'm going to call on you first when we get that public hearing. You'll get five minutes to speak instead of three. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Jeannie Whittlesey, Adana's neighbor. So if you want me to come back in a yes, few minutes, if it's you addressing would. the same thing. Okay. Thank yeah, we have a, a public hearing, and public speaks out for anything but public hearings. Hi, my name is Mark Otten, and I'm here to discuss uh, uh, 17 Res 11, which is the rezoning at uh, the corner of uh, Kildare Farm in Penny. Um, I'm a resident of Dutchman Downs neighborhood, which has an entrance about a, a block from that intersection, and I drive through that intersection uh, twice a day and at least once on Sunday, so that's why I have a, a distinct interest in it. Um, I'm trying to advocate for uh, voting against that rezoning. Um, I did notice in the notes that that was a five to four decision, so obviously there's some controversy there. And the point that I would like to make is that a sheet at that corner is inconsistent with the scope and nature of, of, of sheets um, gasoline stations. If you go to Google Maps and Google Sheets that are nearby that uh, location, you will find that all the other Sheets gas stations are either on a major highway like uh, uh, I-40 or US-1 or um, US-70 um, or they are in the middle of a large uh, commercial industrial um, zoned area. If you look at the zoning map for that intersection, there is residential on all four sides of it. There's a very small little commercial island where there was a grocery store that shut down that's now I believe a, um, I, I think a cross train or something like that, and some other small businesses and a drug store and a, a fast food station but something on the scope of a, of a, a Sheets uh, gas station, like you see when you're driving out to RDU, just is not gonna fit in that um, type of a property location. And so I would um, ask you that to um, preserve the nature of that portion of the neighborhood to uh, turn down that request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Out. Well, since I've been to every hearing with this particular rezoning, I figured I'd come to the last one. I kind of feel like it's Groundhog Day, but uh, we'll go through this. But I'm talking about the rezoning Give of Penny, Penny Road and Kildare Farm, Chris Mahalik. Thank you. 10816 West Bridgeford. And what you have in front of you, and I just made this up for myself in the, over the last few days, and I'm going to re-echo what has been said numerous times. For the most part, when we've had all these hearings associated with this gas station, there has been little to no like argument that something needs to be done. It needs to be improved. There is something that needs to be done. But what you'll see here is that, and I don't know if this is the final proposal from Cary Oil, but you see there at the top it says, you know, the breeze, it has nine pumps and 18 fueling stations. I, you know, listed out the other six or so gas stations that I patronize in the area, and not one of them is close to that size. <laughs> and as my, you know, the, pre the previous speaker said, the sheets, and the kangaroo, or whatever it's called now, the Circle K on US 1 and 1010, they're not as big as the original proposal that was there if this is going to be 18 pump, uh, fueling stations and nine pumps. This has been said numerous times by various people over the course of the action, and I have to say that, you know, this is, I just want to make sure that the council understands this. I know you guys have gotten a lot of emails from the constituents, but to me, this kind of puts it right in the right spot. Does the gas station need to be improved? Yes, but does it need to be a sheets type that's gonna be somewhat airport size? No, it's inconsistent with the neighborhood, it's inconsistent with the, uh, you know, the traffic flow, and it simply won't work, all right? And that's really what you know, most of my neighbors would say. Now I'm gonna get off topic a little bit, and I wanna say something about the general process itself. The overall process as it has been, has been very good. I have to say the planning and zoning department in Cary has been very responsive. I have to say, when I make a call, the Katie, she rec returns my call within a day. What I have a problem with as we go through this thing, and I think this is gonna be a problem as we move forward in time, is there was a huge gap between, you know, the planning and zoning department kind of said, this is what the developer can do. This is what the law allows. Just because the law allows it or the zoning allows it, 
doesn't mean that it's really right or permissible there is a gap between what the planning department is like providing us and what the developers have to do there is a delicate balance here and there has not been an advocate for the people as to say what do we do here I have a full time job and it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a bear trying to keep up with this stuff I can't imagine what it would be if it was a developer and these guys from Cariola have been pretty decent to work with I don't agree with everything that they do but they've been pretty upfront about it I can't imagine what it would be if a developer was kind of underhanded they just wanted to go through all these different things so I urge you to kind of look at what the process is the planning and zoning department or zoning board they voted five to four for this one but every single zoning person who voted for it had you know reservations about the size so I'd like, I urge you to keep that in mind thank you thank you next speaker please Good evening. My name is Jim Thompson, um, 801 Manchester Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm here um, on behalf of my family that owns the 5.8-acre uh, tract that's been uh, referenced as 17REZ12. Um, in the mid-1980s, my father, Odell Thompson, and several of his uh, friends, business colleagues, assembled the land for the Silverton Pud, and they um, um, owned and developed that property. Um, they worked with the town, the town planners, and um, coming up with a um, land plan and the uh, zoning that would fit with that property. And as you know, this 5.8 acre site was zoned for O and I. Um, for over 30 years, this property has been here um, and is available and for sale for this use. Um, but we have yet to attract any um, office tenants um, or anybody that's interested in using the site uh, for office. Um, recently, we've been encouraged to uh, watch the town as they have rezoned several um, tracks throughout town that are O&I and have uh, rezoned those for um, residential purposes and, and noted tonight was the, uh, the Walton Wood um, property um, adjacent and across the street and we were encouraged by that to see the, um, the shopping center and the um, O&I property um, that Wayne Collins owned um, rezoned for the residential purposes. Um, for Walton Wood, and so um, I'm here tonight to ask for your support um, for the rezoning request to change our track from O&I um, to residential. I believe that they're asking for um, seven units per acre, um, approximately 36 uh, units on this site, and um, you know, in doing so, I do believe that this will provide the town much greater control over this site to apply uh, significant zoning restrictions that are being requested uh, for this use. Um, it also provides clarity for the Winbrook townhome community um, and the assurance that the proposed use is consistent with their property and would be a complement to the existing uh, Silverton community and the newly approved Walton Wood community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Jessica McClure, 3808 Farringdon Place. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you for hearing from us. Uh, I want to let you know you're in a very special time for me. This is the first time in my 10-year tenure that both work and home have crossed. I am a professional traffic engineer. I live off of Weston Parkway. I have many friends, several friends that live in the Winbrook neighborhood. I drive through the intersection of Evans and Cary Parkway at least once a day every day. I drive in and out of Winbrook at least twice a weekend. Uh, so I can certainly appreciate the traffic conditions that are out there, the struggles that are out there. Um, you know, and I think speaking on this, the site is going to be developed regardless. It's, it's inevitable. It's going to be developed O&I, residential, something at some point. That's growth, and that's good. Um, I think bringing the scale of everything back into this is a little helpful. Um, under the O&I designation, they can fit 46,000 to 77,000, depending on their setbacks and parking and everything like that. 46,000 is double the size of the North Carolina Dental Society that's on the corner there. That building is, those two buildings are 23,000. So this would, in effect, by right, be able to double that square footage. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about economic development versus traffic. And that putting the <coughs> office building there would have up to you know 250 jobs. Uh, those people have to get to work. How do they get to work? In America, single occupancy vehicles. 
so that's going to put traffic that's not there now coming to work specifically there um, for the office <coughs> use office and industrial I offer has a very demanding AM and PM peak period uh, statistically residential uses also have a strong AM and PM peak period now there are more trips throughout the day uh, by you know, people who have different work schedules, people who stay home, people you know taking care of the kids and things like that. Uh, but they both have an AM and PM peak. And with this, some numbers were quoted earlier, and they are true that the townhouses, uh, 41. I want to reiterate that the high density we're calling out here is 41 townhouses. 41 townhouses is half the size of Winbrook. So the development we are asking to put here is half the size, half the traffic of Winbrook. Daily townhouses, 41, 238. Now, it is spread out throughout the day, but it is concentrated in an AM and peak hour. Um, I offer for the offices for 46,000 in the AM peak period alone, we're looking at 103 trips in and out. For the 77,000 by right, we're looking at 155 in and out. So I just wanted to bring the scale back into this. Trust me, I'm not against office, industrial, commercial. As a traffic engineer, I would not be gainfully employed if we did not have developments that were offering traffic and growth to our, our area. So I, I completely understand that. However, the scale of this property and the use, the visibility from the roadway, the setbacks, the stream buffer, O and I, you're just not going to get something thriving there in the way that something on that corner, the big old lot, corner visibility, easy access, um, you're just not going to have that with this. And I think with the access on Geyer Court, also right and right out off of Cary Parkway, limiting the development to 41 units uh, really takes the traffic down and will help out in the area. I know I'd rather drive through with a 41 unit development there than any type of office. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the Vice President of Land for Shenandoah Homes and Capital Properties. We're the applicant for the project at uh, the Cary Parkway and Evans Road. <coughs> and as was mentioned earlier, I think it's important to keep into perspective the unit count. It's 5.88 acres at maximum density of seven units per acre. It's easy to do the math. When one conjures up the idea of high density, I don't think 36 to 40 units is in the same category as what we all think about as high density and the images that that brings about. We talked a little bit about traffic tonight and the concerns and everybody, we all have concerns about traffic and know what that's about. So I personally went to the site during rush hour on Monday at about 520, and I went again tonight before the meeting. I, I drove into the Winbrook entry easily. There was, I was the only car that went right in. I turned around, I came right back out, I made a left turn, I sat and I watched for a while. And I didn't have any problem getting in and out of the entry at all. Winbrook is a 95 unit development. What we're proposing is less than half of that. I I think and we believe that the traffic impact of both units is, of, of both projects Winbrook existing and our project proposed are insignificant in the scope of the traffic on the those roads and and what's existing today albeit my anecdotal drive by on Monday and today is only two visits to the site during rush hour, but nonetheless, it was n not a problem in the least. And um, we believe that our housing development is the highest and best use for the property. The five acre site is topographically challenged and the market has spoken and 
the size of the site, as you can see other commercial developments that have flourished in Cary with office and other components are larger projects that do attract the corporate type of client. And I'll make one more uh, observation in your packet that I handed out is a list of the allowed uses under the O&I category. And you'll see there's a wide cross-section of uses that not just office, but uses in even including crematorium. And so with the rezoning comes certainty. Mr. Palmer, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Jason Barron with Morningstar Law Group. Uh, here to speak about 17 REZ 11, a case which is on for discussion. Uh, here with me tonight is uh, Mr. Jim Bosworth and Mark Smith of Breeze Through Markets. They're the uh, existing operators of the convenience store that is at that location and the hopeful operators of the redeveloped convenience store at that location. Uh, also here with me is Kyle Greer, who's been uh, providing consulting work uh, alongside me. We've been working together to try to, uh, to find the right mix for this project. Uh, we are obviously here to ask for you all support of the case. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that I want to talk about with, about this case. I, I, three minutes doesn't afford me a lot of time to cover all of the things about this case. And I was sitting here struggling. I was sitting in the, in the audience. I was sitting in my home. I was sitting in my office trying to figure out what to say in three minutes that could capture this case. And I realized it's kind of an impossibility. And part of that is because we've been in the process for 15 months. And that 15 months isn't because we've been sitting around and waiting for a case to get scheduled. That's not 15 months where we can point to the planning department and say they weren't doing their job or transportation wasn't doing their job. Not at all. Everybody did their job. We have been in the process for 15 months because I have had the good fortune to work with Cary Oil Company on the site. And Cary Oil was committed to listening and to doing the right thing from day one. The conditions that are associated with this case are clearly evident that there is an owner and an applicant that is standing before you tonight that has done the right thing and has wanted to do the right thing all along. We had a four-month delay in the spring of last year. In fact, I went back to my notes. We filed this case in February of 2017. The first schedule that I sent to carry off for this case, I told them they would be decided in August of 2017. That was the published schedule that the town had. I told them we'd be out of the process August 27th. Here we are. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that for, to, to create sympathy, but I'm telling you, we have been involved in this process because Cariol has been committed to doing the right thing. We took a four-month delay in, the, in spring of last year to work on stormwater, an existing stormwater problem created by third parties. It was one of those things where I told the guys, look, you can stand up and you can say the town has strict stormwater requirements and we're going to comply with those stormwater requirements like you all have heard on a number of occasions. That wasn't enough for them. They met in people's living rooms. They studied the problem. They understood there was a floodway. They worked f with the town engineering staff for more than two months to make sure that we could offer a condition. The initial response was we can't, we can't offer a condition. A and we worked with the town. We appreciate the town engineering department working with us to make sure we could offer the 100-year storm event and reducing that by 25%. This is a case that is before you all tonight that has been fully vetted, that is fully mature, and should have the support of the majority of people in the room. Mr. Mihalak uh, talked about the process. I want to say I've got 10 seconds to go. I want to say the process has worked as far as I'm concerned. The part that hasn't worked is that after the Planning and Zoning Board meeting, a petition was created, and you all heard from a bunch of people who haven't given us the opportunity to talk to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Anyone else to speak if public speaks out? Anyone at all? Seeing no one will close public speaks out and move to our next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda portion of tonight's meeting. For the benefit of people in the audience and those uh, watching our meeting on TV, I'll take a moment to review the consent agenda items. On the consent agenda, we have minutes. We have ACT-03 and ACT-04 land development ordinance amendments. Bid award for Western, Way, Western Carry Water Main Improvements. Gordon Street and Southwest Maynard Road rezoning 17 REZ 19. Request for connection to Municipal Sewer 3608 Bent Grass Court. Interlocal agreement with Wake County Public Schools. 18A01 Green Level West Road and Pine Rail Lane Annexation. 18A07 3500 Arthur Pierce LLC and Swicegood Annexation. 
Geneva Lloyd Baker Heirs, Annexation 18A03. Rex Hospital Incorporated, Annexation 18A02. Would council members like any of these items pulled for discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And that takes us to public hearings. Same rules apply for public hearings that apply for public speaks out with one exception. <clears throat> Instead of three minutes, you now have five minutes for your comments. Our first public hearing is on the utility development fee analysis. Chief Financial Officer Karen Mills will present the item. We'll hold the public hearing. And... I don't know what happens after public hearing. I have to ask. That's it. Okay. Have to listen tonight. No decisions required. Like no decision. Nothing. Here. Not tonight. Good evening, Council. We're taking steps in a new process set forth by 2017 state legislation that required us to conduct a new utility development fee study and conduct a public hearing. I'll start with a quick overview of utility development fees and provide an overview of the recommended fee study. We charge utility system development fees within our permit process when new construction requires water and sewer service. These fees provide capital to build and maintain utility infrastructure to ensure that capacity is available for new users and to maintain capacity for our existing community. We also charge marginal fees for redevelopment projects if the new utility demand will be greater than the current property use demand. These fees have generated an average of $11.3 billion per year, so you can see what a critical financial resource these fees have provided. As an example, these fees finance capital projects like the new water tanks that are under construction, an important part of building capacity in our water distribution system. Our current utility development fees are charged for water, sewer, and reclaimed uses. These fees were last set in 2012 after a study of our capacity investments and our budgetary plans. Council set the fees at 75% of the maximum calculated cost in the study from 2012, considering fees that were charged by our neighbors and the impacts on economic development. Fees are charged for residential uses on a tiered basis based on the size of the home because home size is a clear indicator of average and peak day utility capacity demand. We have six tiers, including apartments. Non-residential fees are charged per thousand square feet for one of 29 different uses. For example, there are use categories for retail, medical office, restaurant, and warehouse. New state legislation in 2012 requires governments that levy utility development fees to hire a consultant and to conduct a new study and to hold a public hearing on that analysis. As part of the legislative process, the consultant must consider the public input received up till now and tonight before they finalize the report. The new study reflects four changes from our current fees. First, the new legislation does not specifically authorize reclaimed water development fees, so our investments in reclaimed water have been now included in the sewer development fee. Next, we added a 30th use type to recognize a growing industry in alcoholic beverage production for breweries, wineries, cideries, and distilleries. The third change reflects decreasing average usage patterns in residential demand so that each home requires less average and peak day capacity. And last, the maximum that council could choose to charge for non-residential fees decreased from the 2012 maximum, but the maximum fee in the current <coughs> study is higher than what we charge non-residential uses now. We are not asking council to set policy tonight, but just to hold this public hearing on the analysis. And next I'll show you how these new fees compare to our current fees. For example, one of the home sizes, 2,401 to 3,100 square feet, this chart shows the water and sewer development fee total.
current fees would be $5,261 for both water and sewer, but our new fees cannot be higher than $4,586. That's a $675 decrease and 13%. For a sample non-residential use, a medium-sized retail establishment between 20,000 and 80,000 square feet, our current fees per thousand are $552 for both water and sewer. That would total <coughs> 27,600 for a 50,000 square foot retail building as an example. Our new fees could be as much as $624 per thousand square feet, which would be 31,200. 13% increase. Council can choose as policy to charge less than that maximum fee. During our budget discussions, staff will deliver the finalized report with information such as how carries fees compare to other North Carolina utilities, particularly in the Triangle region. So our next steps. After tonight's public hearing, the consultant will consider all of the public comments and they'll finalize their report. Council will consider and adopt a new fee schedule as part of the FY 20, 2019 budget process, and then we'll repeat this process at a minimum of every five years. So with that background, now would be the time for the public hearing on the utility system development fee analysis. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Now's the time for public hearing on utility development fee analysis, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one will close the public hearing and open it up to council members for questions or comments. I just would like to better understand how the recommendation is, or the study came up with reducing fees for residential, but increasing fees for commercial. So our costs and investments in the capacity have increased, and so the capacity is worth more. So that's why the non-residential fees went up. But when we take that total capacity and we look at per unit for residential, because residential <coughs> demand is decreasing, we look at it on an uh, average day and a peak day demand, and each residence is requiring less, and so their fees are less per unit. Okay. Because at first glance, it's just uh, give a little pause to increasing on commercial when we're trying to in incent business and, and bring more jobs and things to carry. So it's right. So we'll bring you options for policy considerations as part of the budget process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, Ms. Mills. Thank you. We now move to our second public hearing. It's on the Glen Eyre expansion. This is 17 REZ 31. Planning Director Deborah Granham will introduce the item. Council will not take action on this item. It's gonna be referred to our Planning and Zoning Board for their review and recommendation, and we will see it at a future date. Ms. Granham. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. For your consideration this evening is a request to rezone property to expand the Glen Eyre Continuing Care Retirement Community. Subject property is located at the 900 block of Kildare Farm Road and West Cornwall Road. It's highlighted here in yellow. This shows you a zoomed in aerial of the subject property, which includes vacant property, a portion of the Mayfair Plaza Shopping Center and property that was previously zoned for an age-restricted multifamily dwelling. You're probably familiar with the Mayfair Plaza Shopping Center. Original construction for this property began back in the early 1980s for a grocery store. The shopping center is anchored by a food lion. <coughs> There's a recent approval um, in the late 90s of a new bank a lot of the buildings at the shopping center have not changed in many years, and the subject property where the rezoning is to occur is where Carolina Pottery is currently located. This shows you a zoomed in view of the parking lot area in front of the Carolina Pottery and a view of the vacant property along Cornwall Road. <coughs> the existing zoning on the subject property is a combination of general commercial, general commercial conditional use, and mixed-use district. As I mentioned, there was a previous approval of a rezoning case to MXD, which was for an age-restricted apartment complex. The applicant has proposed mixed-use district, and with that mixed-use district request comes a preliminary development plan, 
which serves as zoning conditions, letting you know what the maximum heights of buildings are, maximum density, locks in the use, lets you know what buffers are proposed, and addresses things such as access points. There's a few modifications that have been proposed as part of this development plan, which can be considered when you're evaluating something in a mixed-use district. The applicants proposed a maximum building height of 80 feet. They proposed to install sidewalk on just one side of the street that leads from East Cornwall Road into the subject property. And they've proposed a pedestrian-only connection or pedestrian and cycle connection to Rose Street. Um, this is something that can be considered as part of the preliminary development plan. Staff did have several meetings with representatives from police and fire, transportation and facilities, and with our Parks and Recreation Department to discuss options for this. It was determined that because Rose Street Park is currently on two sides of the road, the vehicular connection at this point would not be advantageous to the park, and a number of the residents asked if this could be evaluated. So it is part of the proposal before you with this preliminary development plan. Some concerns from adjacent property owners pertained to what would the buildings look like. So this was an illustration provided by the applicant to give you the idea of the site messing. According to Gary's growth framework map and the Imagine Cary Community <coughs> Plan, the subject property is designated as a commercial, commercial center mixed use district and the proposed use for a continuing care retirement community would be an appropriate use. With our preliminary analysis of the Cary Community Plan, <coughs> staff looked at the LIV chapter. Um, this would provide housing options. It would support residential infill and redevelopment. But we did raise the question, as you may notice in the staff report, is this the most appropriate and the most intense use that we would want to see at this shopping center, at this major gateway into Cary? So those are some things that we've raised to you know, just bring up as things to consider as you're evaluating this request. It does revitalize a targeted redevelopment area, and the buffers that have been proposed um, do appear to provide appropriate transitions. The applicant has not proposed any reductions to streetscape buffers or to perimeter buffers. <coughs> there is a stream buffer on one corner of the subject property, and this is a good time to point out that there have been two phone calls from residents that are immediately adjacent to the property pertaining to concerns about existing conditions on the site, stormwater concerns, and our staff has responded to them. Right now there are some um, stormwater mitigations that occur as a result of the parking lot that's in the Mayfair Plaza Shopping Center, and with new de development on the site, it would be expected to meet our current standards, which are much stricter than were in place when the shopping center was developed. Um, as I mentioned, um, there is a proposal that a connection not be made to Rose Street, which is immediately adjacent to the subject property. The property does have frontage on Kildare Farm Road. A 50-foot streetscape would be required there, and on West Cornwall Road, where a 30-foot streetscape would be required. And this shows you the closest location of a greenway trail in the vicinity of the subject <coughs> property and Rose Street Park, which is a public town of Cary Park. Uh, there is an existing transit route, a go-carry fixed route along Kildare Farm Road. There is the need to relocate a bus stop and shelter, and the applicant is prepared to do that as a result of this proposal if it is approved. Adjacent property owners within 800 feet of the subject property were notified. The property was posted and advertised on the town's website. We had a neighborhood meeting in January of 2018. There were about 25 or 30 residents present, nearby neighbors and property owners. Their number one concern was property height, I'm sorry, building height, connection to Rose Street, the park, what was going to happen to it, a lot of curiosity about what the town's plans were for the park, uh, general questions about development and the town standards, how long would the process take, what were the buffer requirements, what were the requirements for stormwater mitigation and stormwater management. So staff was able to respond to a number of those questions. Since that meeting, we've had uh, several calls, five calls to our department voicing support for the request. Uh, we've also had a call from a citizen who is opposed to the request. They don't feel it's the right use for that property. 
um, comments related to traffic, one call on that. And then, as I mentioned, we have had a couple of phone calls related to stormwater and issues and problems with the current parking lot, how it's used, and our staff has responded to those residents. This concludes the staff presentation, and following the appli applicant's comments and the public hearing, I'll be available for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Granin. At this time, I'd invite the applicant forward for their remarks. Good evening. My name is Paul Gregg, and I'm the executive director at Glen Eyre Retirement Community at 4000 Glen Eyre Circle. I've been with Glen Eyre for 16 years. I live in Cary, only about two miles away from the Mayview Shopping Center. My kids went to Cary High School. We go to church here in Cary. I'm very much a local person, but I'm very interested and involved in the community here in Cary. First, I'd like to thank the staff for doing such a thorough job in explaining the proposed rezoning. I won't repeat what has been said but I do want you to know that several members of our team are here, and if you have any detailed questions, they'd be more than happy to answer those for you. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Glen Eyre. Glen Eyre is a nonprofit, continuing care retirement community. We're nationally accredited. Uh, we're affiliated with the Presbyterian Homes. We're in our 25th year of serving the Cary community. We're not developers. We're not going anywhere. We've been here for 25 years. We have planned to be here another 25 years plus. And Glen Eyre has been very blessed. We've been very successful over the years, and we've grown. We now serve 425 residents in our community, and we've created 285 jobs right here in the heart of Cary. We have close to 500 households on our waiting list. The wait to get into Glen Eyre today is somewhere in the 10 to 12 year range, depending on the unit type. That wait time is getting higher all the time. And it's absolutely imperative that we expand our mission to serve people who want to live at Glen Eyre. We feel like and we hope we have been good neighbors. We've worked hard to earn a good reputation in Cary, and we believe we've been good neighbors and good corporate citizens. This rezoning case is a case in point. We've been very open and transparent with our neighbors and during the whole rezoning process. We held our required neighborhood meeting, but in addition, we reached back out to property owners that attended that meeting to follow up to see if they had any further concerns or questions. We did hold a follow-up meeting with a group of neighbors to discuss the proposed development. These neighbors interacted directly with our architect and our civil engineers. They had their questions answered fully, and everyone agreed it was a very productive meeting. We believe this project is good for our neighborhood, and we believe it's good for Cary. We feel strongly that our expansion is the right use of this property and deserves an, and serves an important population. Cary's community plan identifies a need for senior housing. This rezoning provides Cary with additional senior housing in a location that follows the guidelines outlined in the Cary community plan. The location is adjacent to a shopping center, which the residents can walk to. Glen Eyre residents are a very active group. They shop, they buy groceries, they go out to eat. The new residents will help support retail and other commercial uses within the Mayfair Commercial Center. The project is designed on purpose to embrace the rest of the center and will be well positioned if and when further development occurs. The town has wisely invested a lot of money into a newly resurgent downtown which our future residents will utilize. Our current residents already enjoy the investment the town has made in downtown Cary. The new residents will also eat and shop downtown. They will utilize the new town park and they will utilize the new regional library. The residents will have access to transit, both public and private. I hope the council will support the project for many reasons. The need for senior housing as stated in the Cary community plan is clear. This project is highly compatible with the surrounding neighborhood, and it fits within the guidelines outlined in the Cary Community Plan. The project creates potential outcomes that are beneficial for the existing and future residents of Cary and the community at large. I thank you so much for your time and your consideration.
now it's time for the public hearing for rezoning 17 REZ 31 and I would invite our first speaker forward. Good evening, my name is Tim Devinney. Thank you, Council, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as a downtown business owner and a property owner and a resident, I can tell you that I've experienced firsthand the benefits of having Glen Eyre in our neighborhood. I think that further expansion of Glen Eyre will only enhance the opportunities for downtown businesses. Uh, these are people who do walk and cycle to local businesses, restaurants, uh, the Cary Theater, they'll certainly uh, take advantage of the new regional library and they add diversity to downtown. It's great to have uh, the bars and restaurants full of millennials and young professionals meandering about downtown, but it's also great to have people who've experienced life uh, when downtown wasn't the hopping place that it is now and can really appreciate what you guys and many other people have brought forward to our community. Uh, as has been mentioned by the planning board and as I'm um, planning staff, excuse me, and by Paul, this does fit the Imagine Carry plan and it will enhance our downtown and I for one am fully supportive of an additional Glen Air presence in our community and I thank you for our time. for over 22 years, and I'm greatly in favor of the Glen Eyre expansion. I'm one of the people on, with my wife on the waiting list. <laughs> um, I know the director of Glen Eyre too. Um, but I have one concern that, because I only found out that earlier this week when the things appeared on the website, there appears to be a parking problem at the new expansion. I count on the, on the preliminary drawing only around 92 parking spaces for the, all the residents, employees, service people who show up to repair things and all that, 91 or 92 parking spaces. That's like one third of the number of parking spaces on the other Glen Eyre property in relationship to the uh, size of the, it's comparable almost. There's, there is not enough parking. It needs to be addressed and I believe it will be in the, in the rezoning meeting coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. We are Dan and Joy Pike and have lived at 155 Shirley Drive for 21 years. We are here this evening to provide our support and encourage you to unanimously approve the expansion of the Glen Eyre facility. Let us give you a few reasons on why we're so supportive. They are an amazing corporate neighbor. They keep their, their facilities and grounds well kept and their residents don't throw wild parties until all hours of the night. <laughs> Actually, we really enjoy interacting with their residents as, as they walk down our street and we, uh, we see them at, at the grocery store in, in downtown. After, after we participated in the meeting in January regarding the expansion here in the council chambers, um, Joy and I were very impressed by the look and feel of the expansion. <coughs> We truly believe if approved and built, this facility will be much more pleasing to the eye and act as a much better buffer to surrounding neighborhoods than developed or redeveloped retail space. Plus, the traffic impact will be less than retail as only a small percentage of the, of the residents there drive. Lastly is the fact that we have an aging population. And, 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 we need to, and we need more space for these people to enjoy the twilight of their lives. The expansion will provide more people that enjoyment through their great facilities, excellent programs, and fantastic care. Ladies and gentlemen of the Cary Town Council, thank you very much for this opportunity, and thank you for all that you do for our amazing town. Once again, Joy and I strongly encourage you to please approve the expansion of the Glen Eyre facility. Thank you. My name is Bill Wolf. I live at 121 West Cornwall Road, 
right at the proposed new entrance on Cornwall. Um, I, don't, I saw a couple of uh, Cornwall Village neighbors, but it looks like uh, they had to, uh, to leave. Maybe. Anyways, so on the one hand, I'm not excited about a six-story building directly behind my house in our little neighborhood uh, that's been here since uh, 1998. On the other hand, Glen Eyre is a very good neighbor. They're talking with us. They seem sincere about dr addressing concerns if possible. And frankly, we could do a lot worse. <laughs> the main concern in our neighborhood is drainage. Uh, we'll be contacting Cary since we already have issues on the west side of Cornwall Village. Uh, my understanding is that Glen Eyre will need to show they're not contributing more water as part of the permit process um, after rezoning. I'm also asking Kerry to give, uh, give Glen Eyre some leeway at the new Cornwall entrance to incorporate a safe walkway across Cornwall Road, possibly hide the AT&T utility boxes, leave a reasonable distance between our Cornwall Village entrance and their new entrance, and create an attractive entrance. Uh, that will help the entire neighborhood, not just Glen Eyre. So Glen Eyre's shown an attitude of cooperation, but they can't really be specific right now until the rezoning is approved and they move forward with detailed plans. I've lived in Wake County since 1982, and my observation with large projects is that property values suffer due to uncertainty. And when that's over, they tend to recover. So. My preference is to grant the rezoning sue, soon and uh, keep working out the details as the project moves forward. They'll still need to get approvals as they go, and the sooner this is finished, the sooner the uncertainty will be removed, and overall, I suspect the new development will be attractive and add to our neighborhood and the heart of Cary. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Weinbrecht and council members. I'm Sheila Ogle, I'm a downtown resident. I'm here to fully support the rezoning and the expansion of Glen Eyre. Paul Gregg gave a very excellent presentation to the Heart of Cary Association a few months ago to totally explain to us what the project would look like as well as the need for this expansion. I was also a member of the Imagine Carry Study Commission, and one of our key objectives, as you know, was to repurpose old and tired shopping centers. And I can't think of a better example or a better use to do that for this shopping center with the revitalization of the Cary Town Center, I don't think there would be a need to do anything else with this property as far as a shopping center per se would go. So I'm here to say that I fully support that and I'm looking forward to seeing more senior citizens walking around downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Ralph Ashworth Long, resident of downtown Cary. Good evening. Uh, you know, 25 years ago, we were so excited. Uh, Presbyterian Homes of North Carolina were coming to Cary and built Glen Eyre. And that's the greatest thing that's happened for many, many people. And yesterday, I had the, I had the opportunity of ten, attending their 25th anniversary party. And what a great success this Glen Eyre is. To see so many happy people and people are getting served. I highly recommend and hope that you will support this addition because we need it. The proof of the pudding is, as Paul said, we've got 500 people on a waiting list. So we can't be all that bad, you know, people <laughs> waiting. So uh, someday they may even let me in, who knows? <laughs> but the wonderful thing about this, it's on the edge of downtown and the, with the new library, people can walk to the library. I have actually people walking to the drugstore. When I was 85 years old, he just wants to walk, you know. He didn't have to. Walking in the snow the other day, and I said, we're going to carry you home. He wouldn't let us. 
but you know they, they do want to get out and they want to participate and they are good citizens and they're well educated and we are very impressed with the people some of them have volunteered and you can go to the movie theater down here some of them actually take up the theater tickets so they are part of the community and I highly recommend it and I hope you'll see that this gets done thank you thank you Mr. Advocate next speaker Council, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this case. I'm Ed Clayton. My wife and I have had the good fortune to live in Cary for the past 50 years. During that time, I've served on a number of town boards, including the Planning and Zoning Board, along with Mayor Weinreich and uh, Ed number one here, uh, the Zoning Board of Adjustment, the Environmental Advisory Board, and I've had the good pleasure of chairing each of those boards at one time or another. Uh, just over a year ago, Ruth and I moved to Glen Eyre, so I have a rather biased view of this. <coughs> I am there. Uh, we're delighted to have such a great place in Cary that we can spend our senior years, and Glen Eyre is it. Uh, as you address this zoning request, I'm familiar with the need to evaluate the request against the criteria included in the Cary Community Plan, and that's been mentioned by several speakers. Compliance with the plan, as well as compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood, are important criteria to be met. I believe that the Glen Eyre re rezoning request fulfills that required criteria and will be a valuable addition to Cary and to the Kildare Farm Road neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Next speaker, please. You need a witness. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Regina McLaurin. I live at 3102 Glen Hope Court in Cary. I am a proud graduate of Cary High School and an eight-year former council meeting sitting right there. I've served on the Glen Eyre Board and I've been a resident at Glen Eyre for two years. My mom was a resident for 14 years at Glen Eyre and also a former member of the Cary Board of Adjustment. In the last 25 years, Glen Eyre, Glen Eyre has been an asset to the town of Cary, not only as a place to retire, but for the many citizens that have worked on committees for this town. According to the Cary Community Plan, serving the needs of Cary's aging population is a high priority of the town council. Glen Eyre has always been a good neighbor and will continue to be. I would urge you to vote favorably for this rezoning so that I can continue to think highly of you. <laughs> public hearing. Seeing no one will close the public hearing. I did make one note. One speaker uh, was concerned about not uh, seeing details yet and the uncertainty of what's going on. And, and that's part of the process, unfortunately. So what this is is a rezoning where we decide the type of use. And that's all we can do. And once the type of use has been decided, then the details can come out. The type of use or the rezoning usually takes about three, four months. I'll look at Ms. Grannon as I say this, see if she nods her head. She says yes. And so we have a public hearing, then it goes to the Planning and Zoning Board, then they review it, they make a recommendation, it comes back to us and we make a decision. Uh, so that's the process and even though it takes that long, we want to make sure we do our due diligence, make sure that everything that needs to be heard is heard and we make a good decision. So that's why we have the process, and we will get to the details, and we will focus a lot on the details. Uh, well, at least the staff will. We won't see it unless it's a quasi-judicial meeting. Uh, but they'll make sure that uh, 
no details uh, left unaddressed. And if you're concerned about the details, please contact Ms. Grant, and she's probably going to be the lead on this project throughout. And uh, she'll probably be able to answer any questions you have when they get to that point. I'll be working with Mr. Hales in the planning department, okay. so, so both, both of us are available for your questions. So even after the rezoning is done, assuming it would go forward, if not, we're done. But if it does go forward, then the site plan issues, where all the details come out, uh, can be answered by Ms. Mr. Hales and Ms. Grant. Uh, other comments? Um, in the 11 years I've been sitting up here, I cannot recall a public hearing for a rezoning that warms my heart like this one has done where every speaker gets up and has nothing but positive things to say, not only about the project, but the applicant, the process, and everything that has taken place thus far. It, it's just, it really warms my heart. Um, doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ed. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wolf, um, I appreciated his remarks and his concerns given his proximity to the project. Um, I think his request to as this moves throughout the process and gets to site plan and some other things that, you know, just to be sensitive to the entrance along Cornwall, uh, maybe something can be done with the utility boxes or things to, to make it just look nicer and be a little safer and a benefit for the entire neighborhood. I think that's very, very reasonable request. I think Glen Eyre over the years has demonstrated that they're, you know, they don't want to build anything that's not quality. They want to be a benefit to the neighborhood, not a burden. So. I'm sure they'll take those comments to heart and do what they can to uh, address some of those concerns. But um, also don't want to disappoint Ms. McLaurin at all, um, since she thinks so highly of us. Um, uh, the, some of the stormwater concerns that have been mentioned, uh, as was mentioned in Ms. Grannon's remarks, that you know things that were developed 30, 40 years ago don't have the stormwater requirements that we have today. So I'm, or even 20 years. Or yeah. So I'm, I'm very confident that should this be approved and constructed, that it will lessen those problems that exist today, or at least not make them worse. So um, I'm excited about it. I think it's a great proposal for the Gateway area coming into downtown. It truly fits a need in our community. Um, 500 people on a waiting list. That is phenomenal. I thought that was um, family units. That's probably not very I mean, it's it, even after they con construct this, there's still going to be a waiting list. You know, I mean, it's the great thing about Cary is once people move here, nobody wants to leave. That's right. And we don't want you to leave. So uh, we want to have places where you can live and stay close to your families and, and your kids and grandkids and everything else. So um, thank you to Glen Air. Keep doing what you're doing. Continue to work with the residents and look forward to seeing this one come back. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Other comments? Ms. Huron? Yeah, I usually don't like to comment too much or give my opinion before something goes to planning or zoning board, <laughs> um, but I, I feel I have to uh, for this one. Uh, Mrs. Grannon mentioned or alluded to the intensity in one of her slides, and I've heard some comments from the community that perhaps this location should be developed in a much more intense fashion, um, more commercial, more office, something that offers a higher economic development return, I guess. And there's merit to that, no doubt about it. But the more you think about it, there's often value to the community which can and should be measured in more ways than just dollars and cents. And I think we heard that tonight. Um, we certainly want this place to be redeveloped there. There's no question about it. We all, all want that. And, and I really think this is, in my opinion at least, this is a very appropriate start to that redevelopment. I really appreciate the speakers tonight. And it was almost a Hall of Fame of, it was. <laughs> of public hearings. Other comments? I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, I go back to you. Things are changing. Um, I've got friends who said they took their parents over there and got them on the waiting list. And they said, we got on the waiting list too, because the waiting list is so long, they figure they're going to need it. You know, by the time they get up for them that they're going to be on it as well so that's a great thing that's a that speaks well such a great use for the site um, I, I was uh, I made a visit to Kmart headquarters years ago while this was still at Kmart and uh, knowing Kmart was dying and the guy said you know they were losing out to their com big competitor the other Mart store and 
They said people shop at Kmart for all the wrong reasons. They can park near the door. There's no waiting in line. There's nobody in the aisles with them. And that's a recipe for disaster, and uh, that's what happened here. So we're excited about it. I think it's a great use. Um, I didn't know if uh, if Joy and uh, Dan had heard that if there was a party yesterday, Ralph Ash was at, was at, at Glen Eyre. I don't know if the, the noise carried over to their house or not, but I, it probably wasn't late into the hours of the night. There was probably just a daytime party at Glen Eyre. So it's a great neighbor. It's a great Thank neighbor. you, Mr. George. Ms. Smith. I think everybody's said it. I, the only perspective I have is I wanted to, uh, I was proud to serve with Ms. McLaurin, and I learned very early in, in, in my career back then that when uh, Ms. McLaurin spoke, you listened, and I'm still afraid of her, so I just want you to know <laughs> you got my attention, Regina. <laughs> so thanks for all coming out and, and sharing. I, I, I just want to echo a little bit of what um, uh, Mr. Yerha said. Um, you know, we have the, the scales of balancing um, our need and our desire to see that uh, area redevelop at the same time. Uh, there's something about, uh, uh, I guess the word would be social justice. The, the, the what we can do here, uh, what we can do to help our seniors. And, uh, you know, I know someday I'll be a senior. And I'll have to start someday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, best wishes. Is, is <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Thank you. This will go to our planning and zoning board for their review and recommendation, and we will see it in the future. Thank you, Ms. Granny. We now go to our third public hearing. It's for Green Level West Road and Pine Rail Land Rezoning 18 rez one Ms. Granny will once again introduce the item. Council will not act on this item tonight, but it will be referred to our Planning and Zoning Board for their review and recommendation. Ms. Granite. Thank you. This is a rezoning request for approximately 80 acres located in Western Cary, close to the Chatham County, Wake County property line. Subject property is highlighted here in yellow. It's on the north side of Green Level West Road, and it's located just to the west of the American Tobacco Trail. Subject property is currently located in Wake County and has a Wake County zoning designation of Residential 40 Watershed. There is an associated annexation petition which will be presented to you at a public hearing at a future date. The applicant has proposed transitional residential conditional use. Conditions proposed by the applicant would limit the use to detached dwellings, townhomes and neighborhood recreation They've proposed a maximum of 220 dwelling units, which equates to approximately 2.75 dwelling units per acre. For the townhome portion of the subject property, they have proposed to limit the number of townhomes to 90 units, and that these townhome units would be developed in clusters no larger than 10 acres each, and that these clusters of townhomes would be separated either by a road with a collector standard or higher or by detached dwellings. They've proposed that no townhome dwelling will be located within 100 feet of the western boundary property or the American Tobacco Trail. I would like to point out a correction. Um, one of the zoning conditions that they offered is that the townhomes would have a 100 foot setback from the American Tobacco Trail buffer and there is also that 50 foot buffer. So that, that actually increases that to 150 feet from the American Tobacco Trail. They've also proposed that for the detached dwellings, the lot area shall not include land that's located in adjacent riparian buffers. Now with TR residential, the minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet. The applicant has proposed that no more than 50 lots shall be smaller than 7,000 square feet. So this gives an opportunity to increase the lot size um, you know, at 7,000 square feet um, or larger for all but 50 of the lots. Um, for these larger lots, they've proposed a five foot minimum side yard setback. And then for all the detached dwellings, a 15 foot rear yard setback and a 20 foot uh, front yard setback. So TR residential has some very, very lenient um, setbacks. Um, a three-foot minimum unless there's a firewall. If there's a firewall, 
can be right at the zero property line, zero lot line with a 16 foot aggregate. So for the larger lot subdivisions having a five foot minimum, you still have that 16 foot aggregate. So that increases that also provides that minimum 15 foot rear setback. Whereas without that, it could be as close as three feet to the rear property line. So the zoning conditions are a little bit complex, but, but staff has reviewed them and we need to make sure that we're clear on the setback from the American Tobacco Trail and we'll work with the applicant on making sure that we've got exactly what they're proposing. So this is designated on the future growth framework map as suburban neighborhood, which allows some variety with the housing types. But what I'd like to also point out is that this is also in the green level special planning area and is designated as a neighborhood west of Flat Branch. And this is where the applicant and the staff have um, disagreed to some extent. There's a number of policies that are in the Cary Community Plan that are policies, policy based. They are not codified in the land development ordinance. So there are certain things that the applicant is asking for and staff has pointed out a number of concerns and observations and brought it to their attention. Um, the policies and descriptions and recommendations for this special planning area describe lots of a quarter acre to one acre that it should be predominantly detached residential and pockets of other uses would be allowed if clustered. The plan talks about rural character, preserving rural character, doesn't exactly tell you how to achieve that. So the ordinance doesn't give you that exact formula for how to achieve some of these policies. Views from the American Tobacco Trail should be shielded. The applicants proposing an increased setback, staff has suggested maybe more might be needed. Um, and then a 2.5 aggregate gross density over this entire area for the applicants at 2.75. So the density is not an issue. It's so close, but it's the other elements of the plan that we've raised concerns in the staff report that you may have noticed. And the applicant will be eager to hear your feedback on their proposal. So our, our questions with this first analysis is, is this in compliance? with the special planning area policies and recommendations. It truly does provide more housing options. As you know, in this area, there's a lot of large lot subdivisions. For many years, there were more rural houses, large lot developments, and then with a conservation residential overlay district that we had, we had that density bonus option. You could go up to 1.5 dwelling units per acre. So we saw a surge of more development, but they were larger, more estate homes. So this gives an opportunity to look at some variety with the housing options. But is it the right transition to some of the adjacent existing neighborhoods? And those are some of the questions that staff has raised at this early stage of the evaluation. There's a lot of development activity in the area. So this shows you some of the activity that's going on right now, the densities are in the approximately two dwelling units per acre range when you take into consideration some of those older 1.5 dwelling unit per, lake per acre developments, um, but there's still a lot of vacant land. So this is the first transitional residential request that's come in out here in this area, and that's part of why we've raised some concerns with the applicant. Um, they are impacted heavily by stream buffers and so their condition proposing not to count that stream buffer, riparian buffer land as part of their lot area is a valid zoning condition that does have some merit. Um, this shows you the location of future greenway trails in the vicinity of the site. And as I mentioned, it is immediately adjacent to the American Tobacco Trail and a 50 foot buffer is required along that. Another major concern with this site and another major impact to the applicant is that the Wimberley Road extension goes immediately through the center of the subject property. Um, the subject property does not include, as part of the rezoning request, two parcels of land at the terminus of Wimberley Road. This is the apex jurisdiction to the south of Green Level West Road, and the road goes right into this existing residential property, which is developed with a single family home that would be right at the end of the street. So. That's a concern, that's an observation. As you can see, the alignment on the road today 
Um, and so we did have the resident of this property come and ask for some more information and curious about what's going to happen. We've also heard from the Apex Planning Department. Um, Wimberley Road is being studied. There's possibly going to be a new alignment considered at some point in time. So there's a good bit of uncertainty about this. Um, the applicant has some concerns about the Wimberley Road extension. We've got some concerns about what their proposed alignment is going to be. Um, so you'll hear from the applicant more about that. We did notify property owners within 800 feet of the subject property. The property was posted and advertised. We had a neighborhood meeting in February of this year. 20 adjacent property owners attended. Questions related to concerns about density, the Wimberley Road extension and what sort of impacts it would have on adjacent landowners. Uh, questions about landscaping and perimeter buffers. So this concludes staff's presentation. The applicant is present and would like to make some comments. And then following that, I'm available for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Grannon. At this time, I'd invite the applicant board for their remarks. My name is Barbara Todd. I'm representing the applicants in this case. I will be brief. Deborah made a very excellent summary of our application and the zoning conditions that we are um, wanting to uh, place on this property. We believe that there's a potential for an, uh, several different kinds of housing types on this property. Uh, the TR zoning is what will provide us the flexibility in order to achieve that goal of providing up to maybe three different kinds of dwelling units. Uh, it may be some patio homes, single family detached, and the permitted use in that zoning district, which would be townhouses. We have capped the number of townhouses that we would <coughs> propose for development. We've also capped the number of small lots under 7,000 square feet at 50. So uh, we are looking forward to working with the staff to resolve any issues that are ongoing. And we welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now's the time for the public hearing for Green Level West Road and Pine Rail Lane rezoning 18 RE01. And I would invite Ms. Lee back uh, first and then we'll have other speakers. And I apologize for keeping you waiting. <laughs> Mayor, members of council, we're back again. A uh, couple of points. State I'm one your of those name for the record one more time. Oh, I'm sorry, Adina Lev. Thank you. And I live right off of Bachelor, and we live, we're called the Green Level. I don't know if you've been back there lately, but it looks like a land grab out of the gold rush era. Seriously, the trees are coming down. If you go to the end of Jenks and Wimberley, it looks like something out of Dr. Seuss and Lorax book. It's devastating. The property right behind us, three ponds have been drained. And while that's bad because all the wildlife, I got to see blue herons in trees. I'm told that this is highly unusual. Over the winter, I did get to see the first time black and white woodpeckers. I was excited. Turns out that those are actually red crocketed woodpeckers on the endangered species list. So has any, besides the surveyors, have any wildlife management been involved in this? Because for blue herons to be nesting in trees, seeing endangered animals because all of the devastation on the green level. If you haven't driven it, Please take time, drive through there. Less than, no less than six new developments on just green level. And we're talking all those high density areas. All these houses, all these half million dollar, $800,000 micro mansions are going in. All the trees are gone. WRAL even ran a piece a few months ago about how all these mature forests are being wiped out. So like Mr. Yerha said, 
it can't be just about dollars and cents. People back in the green level, we moved there because we want that rural setting. And to give you an idea of rural setting, you shouldn't be able to see the sky because of all the trees. Why I like the Carolina blue sky, I love the trees. And that's what we want to maintain back there. So while I understand, hey, you got a lot of houses going in, more revenue for the town, something else has to matter. And the devastation that's being visited upon the wildlife and the people back there, it's got to be reconsidered. So I would recommend or request that the zoning be temporarily phased back a little so more study can be done on the impact for everybody back there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. If there are other speakers, if you could line up on the stairs, that would make this go more efficiently. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Jeannie Whittle, see, I'm a neighbor of Adana. I just want to add a couple more things to what she said. I'm not going to repeat. Um, in addition to the birds that she said she's seen, I've seen um, gray fox and red fox. Have you ever seen a red fox out in the open? It is absolutely a beautiful animal. Um, I would hate for those to lose their habitat. I also run and ride my bike on the tobacco trail often, and there is a 100-foot buffer but I think they neglected to say that the ele there's elevation um, on this tract of land that goes down to Tobacco Trail. Um, if it's cleared anymore and, and houses built, I'm concerned about runoff and runoff directly down that hill to the Tobacco Trail from Green Level West all the way up to um, White Oak Church Road. I think that could really be an issue and a lot of people use that road. There was a 5K there just last Saturday. Um, so uh, concerned about that, um, the runoff, the animals. Um, walk my dog down Wimberley all the time. We've even seen a bald eagle run, well, it was an eagle, run a um, fly overhead towards the lake. And I stood there in awe of it because I don't think I've ever seen an eagle before. So the animals, just the area, the rural area, um, there's so much building, as Adana said, all up and down Green Level West Road. We need to preserve our habitat for people and animals. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Lynn Johnson. I live at 4224 Green Level West Road. And you showed the picture of the house during the presentation. Um, I'm also representing tonight Robert and Martha Brinson of 4300. They were unable to attend tonight. Um, uh, my first thought is at the February 7th meeting, both Martha Brinson and myself questioned the about the buffer. The plan that we saw that night showed it everywhere except on our property line. Um, we questioned that. We were told that it was just an omission. Um, I would, we both want to make sure that it actually gets onto the plan and that it is the densest of buffers available. And we would also like to request that fencing be allowed and be per placed there to prevent any entry into our property. Um, I'm especially concerned because of what I've been told about the road. Um, this road has been explained to me that it will be two lanes divided with a median equivalent to the size of Perry Parkway, and it will stop at my property line. I don't want to see that. I don't want to look out my windows, walk in my yard, and see that. So. If nothing else, the buffer and fencing is very critical. But to further address this road, it negatively impacts me. A developer did approach myself and the Brensons, and we were told that they had no interest 
in our property because of the extensive cost of the road. The quote they gave us was $750,000 to a million dollars for our properties alone. And the exact words were, your property would be a burden to us. So after hearing that, I did talk to folks at the town. And I, they did confirm, yes, we are requiring the road on his property. However, it doesn't really impact you because it's only on the 2040 community plan. Well, that road goes through my house. That does impact me. Also, this plan was adopted without any notice to me. I've been told that a newspaper mention of a meeting was supposedly my notification. My mailing address is Apex. I'm not a Cary resident. I had no reason to be reading public notice ads. This plan has impacted and impairs my natural rights to market this property. Very few buyers, if any, are going to consider a home that's going to be bulldozed for a road. The town's actions of this plan have unofficially condemned my property to a bureaucratic, murky, unsaleable status. My question to you is, are there any developer offset fees for this road or other resources that might be utilized in this situation? What does the town of Cary plan to do about this problem that's been created for myself and the Brinkmans? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, I had not anticipated on getting up, but I felt compelled after Ms. Johnson spoke to you to uh, offer a few comments. I will tell you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Mike Hunter. Thank you. Uh, I am not only the developer and my partners, we also own this land. This is a very difficult piece of property, as mentioned earlier, for a variety of reasons. A four-lane divided median right through the middle of it. On top of that, we have a four-lane divided median split in half between us and Apex on Green Level Road. And unfortunately, uh, Ms. Johnson and the Brinsons are right in that square box you see, dissected by it. When you, when you incorporate the right-of-way that's required by the town of Cary, there's essentially nothing left. And on top of that, you have all the widening that's being required. I will tell you that I am in total support and understanding of both families, and I wish there was some uh, some resolution. I can promise you, we would certainly support the road going away. But I've not heard any suggestion of that from the staff. Uh, our understanding is this is a road that has been planned. Uh, in addition, I'd like to mention to you a couple of points on that note. When you put a four-lane divided median road through a piece of property, it is very difficult to consider it to be rural. And there is a little bit of a, of a dilemma of trying to have a rural character with such a major road infrastructure. So what we try to do to offset the extensive nature of the road work that we, ha we are being required to, uh, in addition to the, the right of way alone, we've tried to create a program that is feasible and meets the needs of the citizens that we have, that we've been building and developing for for a number of years, uh, and therefore the smaller lots to cater to an empty nester type, as well as the townhomes. We've been very careful to address the issue of the locations of some of these products. I heard the concern about the runoff with the tobacco trail. We completely agree with that. That's why there is a required buffer there are required buffers around the whole piece of property. In addition to those, as Ms. Grandin said earlier, 
with regard to the town homes we are adding an additional setback from the west side as well as the american tobacco trail thank you for your time thank you anyone else speak at this public hearing okay we're going to close the public hearing before i open it up to council members i want to address some of the things i heard um, about clearing and cutting down mature trees. We do have a tree ordinance. Any tree over 30 inches in diameter requires uh, approval by staff and or approval in a quasi-judicial hearing to take it down. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm going to ask if um, our development plans examiner, Mr. Hales, could add to that, but it does sound as though there's some land out here that is not in carry right now where the tree clearing is is occurring and um, it that may it that's what I heard from the citizen about some of the trees being removed but he can speak to the specifics of the development plan standards and what carries requirements are but the, all the area in white is in Wake County currently okay. is that where the majority of the development is yeah, I'm White. not aware of, of a lot of development going so on. So it's in not under area. Carrie's jurisdiction. Correct. So you're, you're, you're correct. 32 inches and larger and, and healthy as a champion tree. Uh, there are required buffers around the perimeter of the site and along stream features. Uh, most of what is going on in that area right now is outside of Carrie's jurisdiction. And to add to that, and though it sounds real insensitive, um, these property owners have the right to build and there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, if they're building in the county, if they're building to that zoning, uh, then they can build at any time and if they all decide to build at the same day, they can do that. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Uh, I did hear comments about uh, phase back the rezoning. We don't have that kind of authority. The applicant has to offer any conditions related to the rezoning. We don't have authority to dictate conditions uh, with the rezoning. Um, I also heard a comment about uh, we make decisions for revenue and that has never been the case for this council. We never ever make decisions about revenue. That is not what we do. We take each project uh, on its merits and that's how we make our decisions. Runoff, um, we have strict requirements of that and that will be addressed and if it's not uh, then definitely contact the town and they'll they'll adjust it uh, the the fencing and buffer requirements again I don't think we have that authority that has to be offered by the applicant we do have buffer requirements Correct. I don't think we can require fencing uh, the applicant would have to offer that as well uh, road alignment that's a big question mark mm -hmm. uh, that has a lot to do with apex planning Correct. and so it's got to be really difficult for the residents there because they don't know where the road's going to go, mm -hmm. and that severely impacts them, and I get that. Um, but uh, the only thing I guess we can say at this point is keep communicating with Correct. each other and see what we can learn because we don't have the answers to that. As far as I know, that's the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other comments, thoughts? Well, I'll just start with fencing. I, I, uh, be, be, be careful what you wish for. You know, I, I would suggest in working with the uh, developer, you look at um, opaque buffer, you look at things of that nature. Um, fencing looks great the first year, and then many times you regret having it there, personal opinion. Um, I, you know, I think the valid concern is, you know, the protection of yourself and the property and work on finding the best solution for that. You know, you may not just, don't just pinpoint fencing. Look at how you can make that buffer. Look at how, how dense you can make it, things of that nature. Um, you know, that's just an observation from, you drive around and look at some of the areas that have requested that 10, 20 years ago and look at it today. That's just my perspective on that. Overall, um, this is a hard one to follow. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at all these conditions and, and I'm trying to piece it all together. And I respect that it's a complicated piece of land, but um, uh, you know, I just hope uh, working with the uh, staff that um, you work on uh, maybe looking at that density a, a little softer than the amount of 
intensity that you have and that you uh, um, look at how you're going to have those set back you know, to the trail. So. Other comments? Yeah, that, that road alignment issue, that has to get resolved somehow. And it's sure. when you're working with different jurisdictions, I don't know when and how that's ever yeah. going to happen in time for this particular uh, development proposal. But that, and I was just surprised, a four lane median divided through the property. That just seems big, doesn't yeah. it? And that would be a mostly CAMPO funded project, I assume. Uh, we would actually require, and Mr. Jensen's going to speak to that, I believe. Thank you. Usually roads like that are m matched briefly, or briefly, minutely by uh, the town, and Campo does the lion's share of the funding, which means I can tell you right now it's at least 10 years out because it's not on that plan. Oh, at least. Right. So we're talking 15, 20 at the earliest. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I think there's I think there's two issues. One that, that we need to work with our with, uh, with Apex on is there a, is there a, is there a better way to to realign a road or align a roadway through here? Um, so that's the one thing that some homework we need to do. And two is uh, challenge some of the the, the the forecast volumes for that roadway. It, it when we were looking at our uh, at our thoroughfare plan as part of of, of imagine carry it it seemed to justify a four lane mean divided roadway i think we ought to challenge that a little bit through the through campo as far as what their forecast numbers are so i think there's a there's a little bit of homework uh for the town and campo to do but in retrospect retrospect um you know whether uh we build the roadway or development builds the roadway or whatever i think it does need to uh, does need a little bit of of work that may take some time to do so we have I think everybody involved will, will, will work on this case okay well, that's that's great to hear uh, but in the meantime as this takes time if this moves forward the developer still has to account for something that wide and until that changes I guess. yeah until we yeah. until we amend our thoroughfare plan yeah we'll we'll have to do that and, yes and I, I think that's what's preventing the lot sizes from maybe being a little bigger that we would like because they have to account for this road my, my major concern before I heard all this road stuff tonight was the green level special planning area itself. Um, the staff report did a great job at itemizing the different uh, recommendations that the special planning area uh, requires or recommends, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's not in an ordinance. Um, and I'd like to see the applicant respect some of those a little bit more than they are, but I understand the constraints that they're under in this particular but I really think you know, I would certainly would get my vote a lot easier if, if some of those recommendations were, were taken for the Green Level Special Planning Area. Any other comments? Okay, this will go to the Planning and Zoning Board for their review and recommendation, and we'll see it in a couple of months meeting. or so, yeah, future meeting. Thanks all those who spoke at the public hearing. Uh, Council, are we good to go into discussion, or do we need a break? All right, move forward, I heard. Our first discussion item is amendments to the traffic schedule. Uh, traffic schedule eight, Keesler Drive, assistant manager, uh, Allison Hutchins. Is this your first time presenting to us? Second time. Second time, okay. <laughs> She'll introduce the item followed by Mr. Spencer and council may take act. Ms. Hutchins. Well, good evening, council. The item before you tonight is a small yet meaningful glimpse into the future. Cary is a maturing community. As we continue to mature, and as our neighborhoods and commercial areas change over time, that will present us with new challenges. It will require us to examine our past ways of thinking to determine if that approach will continue to serve us well in the future. And this item presents the opportunity to balance the priorities of pedestrian and vehicular safety with the economic health and vitality of the commercial area along Keesler Drive. So now I'll ask David to speak with you more about how we have re-examined our thinking of the past to appropriately respond to the conditions of today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Allison, for that introduction. Good evening, Council. For you tonight, again, is a consideration to allow some additional on-street parking on Keesler Drive. Uh, 
uh, you may be aware, but to provide some background, Keesler Drive is a local street that is located near uh, Wake Med Carey Hospital and the Waver Waverly Place Shopping Center. Um, bounded by Kildare Farm Road and Tryon Road, um, Keesler Drive meanders through an office park that contains mostly medical office buildings. Um, although it is a local street, it is, it is slightly wider than our typical local street since it carries about a 30 foot wide uh, travel way. So prior to 2012, it was not uncommon to see drivers parked on either side of Keesler Drive uh, and walk along the street or across the street to access the local businesses. Fortunately, due to the number of drivers that chose to park on Keesler Drive, vehicles would often park too close to driveways uh, and along both sides of the road. Uh, this resulted in, in limited sight lines for those that are exiting the off-street parking lots. Uh, would often make it difficult for pedestrians to cross the street, particularly older pedestrians. And for those traveling along Keesler Drive, it was difficult to often to see around the curves as they were driving, looking for approaching vehicles. So those citizens shared their concerns uh, with town staff and asked that something to be done to keep their patients and customers safe. Town staff from multiple departments conducted on-site reviews of the available on-street and off-street parking and spoke with the local businesses about their current parking practices. After this review, staff determined that safety could be improved along Keesler Drive by limiting parking to off-street lots. So in April of 2012, council approved parking restrictions along both sides of Keesler Drive from Kildare Farm Road to Tryon Road. So following the change, business owners at 1815 Kildare Farm Road, which is shown on this slide uh, in the uh, blue rectangle, expressed some concerns about overcrowding in their off-street parking lot. In order to ease the burden uh, that the parking restrictions on Keesler Drive had on the tenants of 1815 Keesler Drive, Staff recommended on-street parking be permitted on the south side of Keesler Drive near Kildare Farm Road for about 500 feet. Those areas are shown in green on this slide. Uh, this area satisfied the town's initial safety concerns while also allowing some relief to those overcrowded lots. Uh, council adopted this modification in July of 2012. So there have been some changes in the commercial space along Keesler Drive since 2012. Currently, the tenants at 1815 Kildare Farm Road include um, a credit union office space as well as some medical providers. Uh, one of the concerns of the, of the tenants still is the continual need for parking, something that the current site uh, that you can see on this slide uh, does not provide. So staff has met in the past with the property owners to determine if there were any way on site to provide some additional spaces uh, on their lot uh, to accommodate parking. However, the current layout is just not conducive for uh, any, uh, to meet really what their ultimate needs are. Uh, so on this slide, you can also see that uh, the parking spaces that were provided gives us um, along that street approximately uh, room for approximately 13 vehicles to park along Keesler Drive in direct vicinity of the 1815 Kildare Farm Road building. So providing flexibility when and where it makes sense to our business partners is of importance to the town. Staff investigated the current parking restrictions to determine if any additional spaces could be provided. So based on the outcome of our investigation, which was similar to what we conducted in 2012, staff has identified additional segments on the north side of Keesler Drive, uh, closer to the large curve, where approximately 17 vehicles can be accommodated. Um, Available parking along this section will be similar to what's provided on the uh, initial section. They'll be designated by signs, not by any markings. Um, so on this slide, you can see that we should expect to increase the number of on-street parking spaces from 13, which is now, to approximately 30 vehicles um, if this uh, schedule change is adopted. So staff recommends that council adopts the attached amendment for traffic schedule eight for Keesler Drive to allow more on-street parking. happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, questions, comments, or motion? Well, it's, it's a chronic problem. It's been for a long time. And if, it, if I had a magic wand, I'd like to see what's happening behind the hospital where those eight buildings are being taken down and, and made into something more um, um, efficient and convenient. Um, 
it's an aging area, a lot of buildings. Um, they've tried a lot of things there. There was even discussions in the past of some kind of a shuttle service or something, but there's just not enough support from the businesses there. And I guess uh, this is at least a step to try to alleviate it. And I, I would make a motion to approve. Okay, good. Motion and a second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our next discussion item. Agreements for Swift Creek Greenway construction. We'll have Dana Widmar introduce this item. And following her presentation, uh, Paul Kuhn will also provide information. Ms. Widmar. Good evening. Well, as you know, uh, there are primarily two ways that we receive federal funding on transportation projects. Uh, one way is through NCDOT's competitive STIP process, and the other is through CAMPO's competitive LAP process. Uh, as it relates to funding on bike ped projects, um, those projects that are funded by either process are implemented in the same way through the local agency. So the STIP process is uh, one that um, was adopted last year, or the STIP plan that was adopted last year. It has a very favorable funding program for bike ped projects. And that is at the maximum rate of 80% in federal funding for projects that are implemented by the local community. And that includes the additional requests that are within the policies. So um, we were informed uh, last year of a couple of projects in Cary, so we're excited to talk to you about that. Now, both of these projects um, meet the goals of the Imagine Cary Community Plan identified in the Move and Engage chapters. In particular, Policy 4 in the Move chapter focuses on transportation investments to bridge gaps and improve connectivity. The Imagine Carry Community Plan includes the Greenway Master Plan, which proposes the complete Greenway system. On the map, you can see the general location of the two projects that were funded in the STIP. The Black Creek Greenway Project, which is the oval at the, top, uh, at the north part of the town, and the um, Swift Creek Greenway, which is a circle at the southern part of town. The Wake County plan, um, the Wake County also adopted a Greenway plan in 2017. It identifies Cary's Greenway system as an important piece to completing a countywide system. Both Black Creek and Swift Creek provide uh, connections to a full regional system. And that is one of the reasons why they received the favorable scoring in the um, uh, NCDOT uh, competitive program. So Paul Kuhn is going to get into some of the details about these two projects for you. Thank you, Dana, and good evening, Council. So it's exciting being here tonight when we did the bike uh, month proclamation, and then we get to come and talk not about one, but two projects that we're getting into DOT funding. Uh, for so first want to talk about the uh, Swift Creek Greenway project and we have a map on the screen and it shows a two and a half mile segment that we would be filling and this would help complete our network connecting from Coca Booth Amphitheater and extending north off the map ultimately to Bond Park where we know that's our hub of our Greenway system and we'll connect with multiple and just the ability to get 80% of the funding um, is fantastic uh, and that was because of the past work that we've done um, in getting previous grant to set the uh, alignment for this project. Uh, the Swift Creek Greenway project will include grade separated crossings of both US 64 and US 1 corridors. And as you may know, there is an existing project that NCDOT is working on for the uh, US 64 through Cary. And it looks like both of the projects, the uh, construction timing should um, coordinate so that both projects can occur at the same time. This is an image of US 64 near the Tryon Road uh, during rush hour just recently. Uh, 
we also, this is Kerry's existing pedestrian bridge on US 164, and we have the opportunity to put a non-standardized um, bridge that can function as a gateway into Kerry in these two locations. So as part of the design process, we'll be looking at those opportunities. Uh, this is the auto park, and the dashed green line shows the approximate location going through the auto park. And the greenway will extend over to Coca Booth Amphitheater. From there, we can pick up the Swift Creek Greenway and connect to Harold um, D. Ritter Park and to um, uh, Hemlock Bluffs Nature Preserve. So this greenway will connect to several destinations that we have. So related to the funding, um, we'll be signing an agreement for the total $15.3 million project, but the funding will be over several years. So this first year is uh, just a small part to uh, get, get the design, and it's uh, 60000 in town funding and $240,000 in NCDOT funding. Then in FY 2020, uh, this will go to $800,000 of town and $3.2 million of NCDOT funding. And then uh, the last chunk, which is mainly for construction, is 2.2 million of town funds and 8.8 .8 million of NCDOT funds. So this brings a total um, project of uh, 3 million of town funds and 12.2 million of DOT funds, so that 80-20 um, split that we've been talking about. With the acceptance of the funds, staff will begin the process of hiring a consultant to complete the design and permitting and begin the easement acquisition process. So staff recommends that council adopt the resolution approving the NCDOT agreement, recognize the 240,000 of NCDOT funding to a new capital project, and appropriate $60,000 in matching funds. For that, I'm available for any questions you may have. Questions for Ms. Kuhn? Just curious, the uh, design and construction costs that are projected in the $15.3 million project, are, are that, is that being projected in today's dollars, or is that projected out to 2022? The, the construction cost does include inflation okay. um, in there over several years. Okay, cool. Uh, I would just add, job well done on staff, working with NCDOT as always to leverage uh, town funds with state funds to get grants. and get really cool things built and carry for a lot less money. So we really appreciate it. Yep. Uh, with that, I'll make a motion to accept staff recommendation. I'll well, second. There's a motion and a second discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. We now move to our third discussion item, an agreement for Black Creek Greenway construction. And once again, Mr. Kuhn will introduce the item. Well, thank you, Mayor. So for our second project, again, this is an NCDOT funded project, and we'll be t talking about Black Creek Greenway, which is one of our longest and most popular trails in Cary due to the connections that it makes to many um, connections. Uh, here's the map showing it connecting from Lake Crabtree down to Bond Park. And as you know, it connects to Umstead State Park at the northern end, as well as uh, Lake Crabtree, uh, where our new trailhead is located. And I just want to take an opportunity to show our new, um, newest greenway that's under construction right now. This is our 700-foot boardwalk that's being uh, constructed across uh, Lake Crabtree. And you can see it's under construction right now. It'll connect into uh, the Black Creek Greenway and should be opening up uh, later this year. So we're really excited to get this one open. I think it's going to be a, one of the jewels in our uh, greenway system. Everybody's going to want to go out there and walk across the lake, and it's going to be really exciting. Um, Black Creek also connects to North Cary Park and to Godbold Park, and it ultimately ends here at the hub in, in Bond Park. And just for those that don't know, our hub ha has maps, it has um, other information about our greenways um, system where you can connect to other greenways, it connects to White Oak and the other trails in Bond Park at this location. And just as a reminder, um, Black Creek is part of the East Coast Greenway system and is part of many spine routes um, as a spine route in Cary's Greenway. So as I said, uh, phase one and two uh, were constructed 25 years ago, and that's the focus of this project. Connects to Umstead, Lake Crabtree, and North Cary Park. And phase two extends on down to West Dynasty Drive. 
and this part connects to many neighborhoods and apartments that are um, in the area. Over the last 25 years, weather, storm events, use have taken their toll on the trail, and this trail is only eight feet wide, so it doesn't meet our current standards um, for greenways. In several locations, the trails are often severely impacted by heavy rains, and the trails in need of major upgrades, realignment, improvements for safety, and to accommodate the, the heavy traffic that the trail just gets. And the project will also help reduce storm damage from heavy rains. Um, when we started beginning the project, stormwater was a big item that we worked on, knowing that that's important. Uh, we've incorporated grass swales. We've moved the um, greenway further away from the creek where we had easements and ability to do that to increase the buffers in that. And we've worked with the Black Creek Watershed Association as we worked on the design. So just to give a little bit more history, since we did have previous funding, um, previously uh, in 2015, we began the design uh, for this and the planning and looked for funding options from both NCD, DOT, and CAMPO. Uh, so in 2016, we did receive $2.6 million of funding from CAMPO only <coughs> for phase one and two. And so the town went ahead and matched that with another $2 million of cost um, for the project. But then, as Dana mentioned, we, we were working with um, NCDOT and heard about a larger um, grant funding through them and said, hey, let's put that on, on hold for the moment and see if we can get this other pot of money that not only would be require less match from the town, but also be able to add another segment of trail to it. And that's what's shown here is, as you may be familiar, trail comes out to West Dynasty Drive and you use the sidewalks or the bike lanes on the road in order to make the two connections over the hill there. And the West Dynasty uh, Drive has um, extremely steep grades that pose a barrier for many of the users. That previous photo didn't really do it justice on how steep it is, but if you're looking for a workout, I'd recommend go, yeah, climb, that hill. <laughs> go climb that hill. And so the phase five portion of the project will complete construction of a quarter mile greenway trail that will eliminate the extremely steep sidewalk connection and allow a direct connection of those two uh, trails that are there rather than having to go up over the hill. Uh, construction of phase five will make it more accessible and enjoyable to a wider segment of the population and maintain more manageable slopes for the cyclists. So the funding. The total project right now is 6.6 .6 million. And just to recap that history that I said, we have 2 million of existing town funds and the 2.6 million of Campo funding that's in the project at this moment. So therefore, we're recommending that the $2.6 million of Campo funding be removed and instead replaced with the current $4 million of NCDOT funds. Uh, the NCDOT funds require a $1 million match and we can use the existing funds towards that match. Combining the projects still leaves a $600,000 gap to complete phase one, two, and five. And so NCDOT makes additional funding available for projects up to 25% of the original grant amount, or approximately 1 million in our case, um, after the project is bid. So this would allow uh, for approximately 400,000 to be returned to the fund balance this year. Now, in the event that we don't get that additional funding, um, the town would need to appropriate the additional um, funding to make that um, gap breakdown, but we are expecting that. So, um, as we show here, if that additional funding is approved, then our breakdown would be 1.6 million of town fund and 5 million of NCDOT funding. And this project will help us maintain our existing infrastructure, fill an important gap in our system, and use a, just a small portion of town funding in order to complete the project. So that brings us to staff recommendation and <coughs> to adopt a resolution approving the NCDOT grant um, agreement, recognize the four million of NCDOT funding and remove the 2.6 million of previously appropriated CAMPO funding. With that, available to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Ms. Keene? Or a motion? I make a motion to adopt the staff resolution. Second. Motion.
discussion and a second discussion. Just again, job well done. You guys are awesome. Thank you. These are these are huge quality of life improvements. Big deal. This is a big this, deal. This is going to be huge. I can't tell you how many people I hear from on that hill on Dynasty. I mean, this is going to make so many people so happy. I mean, awesome. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Keeney. Thank you. Now move to our fourth discussion item, 17 RZ 11, Kildare Farm Road and Penny Road Assemblage rezoning. We're going to hear from Katie Dry, followed by a recommendation from our Planning and Zoning Chair, who's here tonight, I hope. Can, Ms. Dry, can we, I'm sorry, can we take a break? Um, you know, it's three hours. Okay. okay. Five minutes. I want to Let's be real strict because wanna, we got two I more to go. I want to concentrate. Okay. Five minute break.
council meeting at this time. We're on discussion item four. We had Katie Dry at the podium and she's back. <laughs> Good evening, council. For your consideration as a request to rezone 3.3 acres at the intersection of Kildare Farm Road and Penny Road. This site has an existing gas station with a 2,400 square foot building on a 0.88 acre site. The total assemblage of properties for this uh, rezoning is four, um, for a total of 3.3 acres. The current zoning for the site is general commercial and residential 40. The site's also in a mixed use overlay district in, in, in the Swift Creek Watershed Protection Overlay District. The site is within the new urban uh, area of the Swift Creek, which limits new impervious surface area to a maximum of 30%. The applicant's proposing to rezone all four properties to general commercial with associated conditions. These include limiting the use to a convenience store with vehicle filling stations, prohibiting the use of drive throughs or car washes on the site, setting a maximum of 18 fueling positions and a max building size of 4,800 square feet, uh, making sure that canopy will be no closer than 150 feet from the intersection, limiting hours of operation. Uh, they're proposing increased measures for stormwater control and uh, buffers along the western property boundary, the southern property boundary with increased building setbacks. They're also proposing a privacy fence along these property boundaries. First, uh, I'd like to just make sure everyone, um, for the sake of the audience, understands the definition of a fueling position. The applicants proposed a maximum of 18 fueling positions, so I have an example here to show um, what that is referring to. So when we say fueling position, the definition of that refers to the maximum number of vehicles that can be fueled simultaneously at a service station. So in this picture here, within the window, um, that we're looking in, we can see a maximum of six cars can be fueled at one time within this window of this picture. So that would be six fueling positions. So as a reminder, the applicants proposed 18 fueling positions with a max building size of 4,800 square feet. I'd like to note that the elements of the conditions that are in yellow are elements that have changed since this case was before you originally for a public hearing. The applicants reduced the number of fueling positions from 20 to 18. They've reduced the building size from 5,500 square feet to 4,800. They've added building setbacks along the western and southern property boundary and proposed a privacy fence along those property boundaries as well. When the case was evaluated using the Imagine Carry Community Plan, it's noted that the site is located within the suburban neighborhood development category with Penny Road being the dividing line. The suburban neighborhood should serve as a transition zone to rural and county development and consist of large and small lot single family development. A limited amount of non-residential uses, including neighborhood commercial, can be appropriate at the edges of residential areas. This site is clearly at the edge of the suburban neighborhood and is at the intersection of two major thoroughfares. The proposal is to replace an aging existing gas, gas station with a larger station on a larger assemblage of property, which does address policies from the work chapter, which encourages redevelopment of existing and aging businesses. The analysis suggests that the residential or a non-residential use and the redevelopment of an aging business may be appropriate at this location. Conformity with the Cary Community Plan depends on the specific use, the intensity, the compatibility, and transitions. <coughs> First, let's look at transitions. A landscape buffer is not required for the site because the site and the neighboring properties are within the mixed use overlay district. Applicants may offer a condition to establish uh, buffers, and for this site, the applicant's offering a 35 foot buffer along the western property line and a 10 foot buffer along the southern property line. They've also proposed a privacy fence along these property lines as well. The site will be required to have a 30-foot streetscape per the LDO along Penny Road and Kildare Farm Road. And since the initial town council public hearing, the applicant has added a 150-foot building setback on the western property line and a 50-foot building setback <coughs> on the southern property line, as well as the provisions for the privacy fence. And as a point of clarification, the building setbacks apply to buildings and other structures, but elements such as parking, drive aisles, um, things like that can be within the building setback. 
When looking at the site intensity, we note the site is constrained by environmental regulations. The properties within the new suburban district of the Swift Creek Land Management Plan, which has a maximum of 30% impervious surface limits for new development. The applicant has also proposed a condition which states that in addition to meeting all the town of Perry requirements, a stormwater control device shall reduce the runoff rate at the point of interest shown here, um, which is the, the red circle that you see on this property, where the water flows to on the site. Um, so again, they will reduce the water runoff right, rates at this point of interest for the one, two, five, 10, 25, 100 year storm events by at least 25%. The case had the initial public or public meeting or neighborhood meeting, excuse me, on April 5th of last year. The applicant did have two follow-up neighborhood meetings in May and another one in January of this year. The applicant has proposed additional conditions to address some of the concerns. Uh, the case went to town council for a public hearing in October and to the planning and zoning board in January of this year. Now for this site, staff's recommendation is for approval. This is a case where there are many pros and cons that were analyzed when using the Imagine Carry Community Plan. And I'd like to run through a few points of analysis. The site is designated as a suburban neighborhood on the future growth framework map. This is des described as a transition zone to rural and county development. Suburban neighborhoods can have a limited amount of non-residential development, including neighborhood commercial and small format commercial uses along the edges of residential areas. This site is located at the intersection of two major thoroughfares and is clearly on the edge of the suburban neighborhood. Following the guidance of the Cary Community Plan, staff notes that a gas station would be an appropriate use. However, the size and intensity of the use should also be considered. And when considering the intensity of the site, the proposal would allow for a maximum of 18 fueling positions with a 4,800 square foot building on a 3.3 acre site. This suggests that the intensity may be at the upper limit for small format commercial as envisioned by the future growth framework. The redevelopment and expansion of this site, however, is supported by the Imagine Carry Community Plan, which does have policy statements to retain and grow existing carry businesses. Staff also notes that there are constraints on the site, including environmental regulations, as well as zoning conditions offered by the applicant, which limit the intensity of the use. So the applicants propose to limit the intensity of the site through zoning conditions to mitigate stormwater runoff above and beyond the requirements of the LDO. They've also proposed to restrict certain accessory uses by prohibiting a car wash, uh, prohibiting a drive through on the site. They are limiting the hours of operation and they've reduced the number of fueling positions from an original proposal of 24 down to 18. It's also noted that the site is in the new suburban district of the Swift Creek Land Management Plan, which has a maximum of 30% pervious, impervious surface limit for new development. And so in summary, staff is recommending on balance approval for this request. The planning uh, zoning board held a public hearing for this <coughs> case and recommended approval with a vote of five to four and board chair Mark Evangelista is here to share a summary of their discussion. Hello, good evening. Before I begin, I should point out that when we got the case, it was a 5,500 square foot building and 20 fueling stations. And I, I mentioned 20 because that number 20 was a big thing in some of the folks who voted against it. In fact, uh, during our public hearing, it was presented to us that I believe only at the airport is the only place that has 20 fueling stations. And it was 20, 20. That was just too big for some of our members handle. That's from what I understand not what's before you today. Uh, there was one member who believed that the increase in traffic that was in our staff report was underestimated. That 20 fueling stations once again would create more traffic than we were uh, we were dealing with and he had some trepidations about that hence that vote against. The votes for were much uh, what you just heard. The concessions, the the voluntary uh, zoning conditions put forward to eliminate a car wash, to eliminate a drive-through, to do the extra mitigations on the stormwater, and also the buffers, the, the, these giant setbacks, not required, but, but very, very big concessions 
all with the neighboring residential area in mind. And you know, you hear from, we uh, notice people not just adjacent, but, but in, in other areas, and we hear from all of them. But when it came to the area most directly affected by this development, there were an awful lot of really good mitigations offered by the applicant, offered up as conditions. And that was what really helped a lot of us get over the hump and, and vote for it. And once again, the last thing, this is a major intersection of two thoroughfares. I understand that there's some residential and, and this is the high end of it, but these are one very large thoroughfare, or thoroughfare right now and one soon to be large thoroughfare when Penny Road is finished. So it's kind of hard to imagine something other than a project like this at that intersection. So that's where we are on, uh, on our five to four. Questions for Mr. Evangelista? Thank you. This concludes staff's presentation. We are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dry. This uh, uh, project has been ongoing, as the applicant said earlier this evening, for 15 months. And uh, I talked with him two or three times about this. And he said he's had multiple meetings with not a lot of people involved. Uh, they have made concessions. He talked with me about that. Uh, but since the Planning and Zoning Board, since earlier this year, uh, there's been a lot of social media activity on this, and that generated a lot of email. And what I learned from all that email is, one, now the people are involved and they're active. And to me, it doesn't matter when in the process they get active, but it's important that they get ac active. So that was, that was good news to hear. <coughs> and uh, so they're active, uh, but then there's a lot of misinformation, too. Uh, and, and I normally don't like tabling unless something positive or something beneficial can come out of it. And I think tabling might uh, work in this case. Why? Because I think the people that really have questions, the people that really want to be heard, the people that really want answers to those questions um, can meet in a public setting and, and get answers to those questions. And then we'll know what all their issues are by the time it comes back to us, and we'll have answers. And, that doesn't mean that the applicant will do anything different. He might do exactly what he's proposing tonight, uh, but it would make me feel better, and, and I think I have to have this to support it. Uh, right now, I can't support it uh, until all the people have had their say, and I know, understand all the issues that, that I have. And I'm not asking for more emails. God, I've gotten like dozens and dozens of emails, but I'm asking for a public input session uh, where people can talk about the questions and the issues that they have. And that's my concern with supporting it tonight. I can't support it the way it is tonight. I would prefer uh, that the applicant have yet another meeting because of all the activity uh, since social media, it hit the social media side. And uh, Ms. France, I know you wanted to say something on this as well. Well, I mean, just a counterpoint, you know, uh, it has been going through the process for an incredibly long time, and I think that it's that's largely been at the, um, the applicant trying to do the right thing and, and be a good neighbor and listen to all the neighboring residents' concerns. And, you know, the biggest one to me was the stormwater and the existing problems that are, are not in any way, shape, or form this applicant's, you know, they didn't cause the problem. But they saw it as a real problem and sharpened their pencils and worked with our town staff for a number of months to come up with a way to not just mitigate for the, you know, the five, the 10, the 25 year storm, but to re the 100 year storm to reduce that by at least 25%. I don't know that I've ever seen a rezoning case where they've done that. Um, they heard a concern about they didn't want car washes, so they conditioned no car washes. They didn't, they heard a concern that they didn't want anything with drive throughs so they conditioned no drive throughs um, there was concerns with the buffering that they didn't have to offer. They offered 35-foot type A buffer. There was a concern expressed by the neighbors about, you know, staying open 24-7, so they conditioned to close at midnight and open at 6 a.m. There were some neighbors that were concerned that people might wander over there, so they conditioned to give them a fence. Um, when this initially started out, they were proposing 24 fueling stations, and they've dropped that down to 18. So I think every concern that they heard that they could address 
has been addressed and now it seems like some are just saying well 18 or 20 fueling positions is just too much but I think when you look at the site holistically and it's three plus acres and where they're positioning the building and where they're positioning the pumps at a major thoroughfare you know let's be real the other road's going to get wide and this is this area is going to continue to grow and develop it's it might seem a little out of place today it's not going to seem out of place in the near future um, so they've already had three neighborhood meetings with folks again to address a number of these concerns I personally don't believe that traffic is as big a concern as the community feels given that most of the traffic that's going to use this facility is going to be already existing traffic that's stopping for gas um, maybe I'm unique in that I don't drive for miles to go to a gas station seems like you use gas that way but I'm going to the one that's closest to me or on my route or on my way to work or that's most convenient I guess that's why they call them convenience stores um, so I'm and they're even addressing some of those traffic problems by making this right in right out you know where now that's not the case so I, I just feel like this applicant has gone above and beyond to address so many concerns I, I just I truly just believe that there's just a contingent out there that just doesn't want this gas station to expand at all I think there are some that are reasonable and might want it reduced a little and then some we got emails of support today from from the neighborhood residents you know so I, I'm prepared to vote for this case tonight um, I, I, I understand your concerns but I think after hearing everything that we've heard I, I just I worry that having another meeting you know gives people false hopes I, I truly believe carry oil has done all they can do to make the project viable and I think just delaying it does nothing but again give people false hopes and drag it out through the process more but if, if that's what it takes that's what it takes other comments <coughs> well <coughs> I came you know, prepared to, to go either way to either vote for it or to table it um, I mean the stormwater is a compelling argument uh, I like you Donna I, I think it's really going to improve traffic rather than make it worse with the right in right out and with the neighbors that I've heard from particularly I got a couple of phone calls of complaints that the current one they have to sit through the stoplight at Penny Road for a cycle before they can pull in and get gas so we're, we're queuing up cars unnecessarily if they could have just turned in the service station further up the road and so I think that so I think it's actually gonna improve traffic uh, I believe and uh, I also got quite a few emails up with pictures of these uh, freestanding red awnings sitting right next to the road saying this doesn't fit in our community and I 100% agree but that's not what's being proposed they're not pr proposing a, a bright red sheets or any other brand sticking out into the edge of the road or right by the edge of the road it, there's buffers and the awnings gonna be on the back side of the building so um, I think that in my mind it, there was some if people real I think if a public meeting lets people realize <coughs> it's not gonna look like all the pictures that I've been emailed um, then I think that's helpful for them to just say what you know it's not going to look like what you're what you're sending me pictures of and I think so I, in that regard I'd, I'd be willing to table and then I asked point blank in multiple emails tell me the number of pumps and I think the only one I got back that was like that anybody that ever gave me a number said four uh, and two there now I, I just I don't understand um, or four filling today where there's actually two pumps there now so I guess there's four positions right now so I just couldn't I just feel like it's um, I feel in support of it I certainly would attend if at all possible uh, that public meeting to hear people's concerns and, and, and value hearing them but also value knowing that some of those fears get allayed because maybe they're they're misinformed or there's the the ginned up through whatever means so I could support I could support tabling it Um, I came prepared to vote tonight also for this um, but I certainly do support the request to table usually tabling something for more discussion results in something positive results in greater understanding even if it doesn't result in a greater in a, in a change to the proposal itself 
And I do remember Mr. Barron about three hours ago now said that he'd be willing to meet with, with the neighbors. Once again, I don't know if they've met or not, but uh, I wouldn't stand in the way of that request. But if we were voting on it, I'd be prepared to vote and make my speech why. Later on, I don't want to waste their time on this. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Sullivan. In my district. Um, You know, I, I, when people have written me, I've, I've shared the link to the PNZ meeting because if there was ever a meeting where um, there was that healthy discussion like we're having now, that was it. There was a lot of concern. And just like uh, staff was uh, struggling with do they approve or not, and, and just like we're having this conversation back and forth, um, that's exactly how that meeting happened and what struck me about the PNZ meeting is just what we were saying that you ha you have uh, so many conditions that are making it compelling um, you know to accept it but there were still reservations from those those five that supported it nobody just felt great it was like one of those where uh, you know using that analogy of 5149 you had you had five feeling one way and four feeling the other so I don't know how you get past that except you reach the point where you have to have the vote. You know, my observations back when this first started was the area, just like many other areas, I'm not saying this is any more unique, but this is an area that, that just happens to be uh, under siege. A lot of the developments in the area um, are now seeing realization of plans that were made in the 80s. There's just a lot of anger and frustration out there. On top of that, um, with these new machines and gadgets that get you around to drive, they, they now tell you the GP, you know, they tell you the ways to avoid the, the main roads, and so now you have all this cut through traffic through the highlands and through all of the above. You know, my, you know, my analogy uh, back then was, you know, it's like you have a plane with an old engine, and you say, you know, you got to fix that that engine, and and to their credit. And they're great, loyal, lifetime people that live in Cary. They came back and did all these things, like the stormwater net. But it's like, you know, fix the engine. It's too big. It's just too big uh, at this moment in time. And it come, keeps coming back, well, we added more first-class seats. I don't want more first-class seats. I think the building size that it originally proposed was absolutely right for that area. But... You know, so we're changing the building size, we're changing this, we're making all these concessions, which demonstrates their good faith and how they're moving. You know, my observation was um, with all the things going on in that area, build it and design it for 20, um, but come in with 12. You know, have the fueling tank capacities or whatever underneath, because the area will grow and there will be a day down the road we will want this. The question is, it's like that level of water, the, uh, the glass of water, drip by drip. This just happened to be the drip that spilled over. And I just think there's a lot of frustration around the size with the fueling positions. Now, we're not here to debate. We've had all of this. I understand that. So I think, it, I think I'll support the tabling um, because I think there's one area of merit that all of you have brought up, and that is the, the poison, the dark side of social media is when misinformation gets out. It is just, it's awful. And then you overlay that on top of people's fears of the growth and the, um, the pressures they're under in their neighborhoods. Um, I don't expect maybe the applicant, it may be changing, I'd like to see that, but I think based on the emails this week, thoughtful, reflective, um, balanced, and saying, you know what? I'd rather deal with the devil I know, a good neighbor that's been around 40 years who's made a lot of concessions than not. And I believe those emails are starting to come because people are looking, they're finally paying attention, not to just the mass volume that you get in social media of sign this petition, but you got people that have signed that position who are now saying, you know, now that I've looked at the facts, now that I've looked at the planning and zoning meeting, now that I better understand, I'm still not really happy. I'm 
I'm still, you know, a little bit frustrated, but uh, more open to understanding that we're protecting a development down there, Windsor Oaks. I'd love to see a little more a vocal out of that group because they're getting so much. But you're right about the traffic. It's not more traffic. You're improving the egress and ingress. You're getting people in and out more. It's important that that community hear that and see that. And, and um, you know, I think um, I wasn't, I'm never excited when we're tabling and I don't see, you know, some magic resolution at the end. But I like your, your comments, Mr. Yerha, and, and, and yours about um, this is just another opportunity to let the community know what's really being offered so that we can, uh, that, that they can uh, get their uh, hands around it and, and, and um, maybe uh, reconsider. You know, be careful, like Grandma used to say, be careful what you wish for. Um, so I'll, I'll support, I'm ready to vote tonight, but I'm, you know, at, to respect your request, um, you know, I'll support the tabling. So. Can I call the applicant down to ask him a question regarding tabling? Sure. I guess my question would be, how much time do you think you may need to have a neighborhood meeting and <coughs> on the next council agenda? And, and before he answers that, is there any way we could do one here or? <coughs> we could certainly uh, facilitate the, the meeting. Okay. Yeah. And that the, might the, even make it better or sure. easier. Mayor, the challenge will be. Um, notifying. I, well, not just notifying, but the applicant I've discussed, identifying yeah. who, who to, who to invite. Every person that has made a public appearance or has approached us has been added to our mailing list when we have had meetings. Uh, tonight, there was a, a gentleman who I hadn't seen before that spoke in opposition case. He was opposing a sheets. I think he has misinformation um, about the nature of the application. But one of the things that we have struggled with since the Planning and Zoning Board recommendation is trying to identify the body of people that I need to communicate with because they haven't reached out to me. They haven't reached out to my client. I understand they've been reaching out to you but they weren't here tonight to hear you all's deliberation, to hear the staff's presentation. I mean, they were given the opportunity, and, and I'm not, I, I wanna be clear, we're happy to meet with them. I understand why the council wants us to do that. I'm happy to share information. I was hopeful that the people who were sending you emails were going to be here tonight so that they could actually hear what the case is about rather than have us you know, do another neighborhood meeting that we've already done several times. And, and, and Mr. Michalak, or Michalak, I apologize for mispronouncing his name, he's been a part of the process all along. He knows exactly what's been going on. I, I know him, I could recognize him when he showed up. Uh, and, and so, uh, but I think there's a lot of folks that you all have heard from that we don't have access to, and I have no real way to identify what body of people we should be inviting other than some sort of mass mailing, which I don't think is productive. Well, he said mass mailing, is there a way to, I mean, we certainly, we, we know who all, is. we have email addresses of people who've emailed us. We certainly could do an email back to them announcing an, an open meeting in addition to whoever we get. Don't, can't we do that? Ms. Johnson, how hard is that for you to get those emails? So maybe Ms. Johnson can provide the emails that we've been getting. All the addresses. I can, I've kept all my emails. Sure. Maybe I'll have better luck getting them here tonight than you did. <laughs> well, how, how much, back to my original question, how much time? I mean, we can, <coughs> assuming there's availability, I, I can get a notice out to, and I get the information, I can get a notice out before the end of tomorrow, if I have it, probably beginning of next week, so it's next two weeks. Meeting. Yeah, I don't want to go past June, we if at all possible. And I, okay. all right. Granted, we've been in this for 15 months, so what's another month? But we would really like to be heard in June, because I understand the council meeting schedule gets a little dicey going into the summer. Um, I'll make a motion to table this until the next council meeting. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Discussion. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dry. We now move to our last discussion item, 17 REZ 12 Silverton PDD Amendment Rezoning. 
This item was previously tabled and will need to be removed from the table before the presentation. Is there a motion to remove it from the table? So moved. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And once again, Ms. Dry will introduce this item. Hello. Um, as was just mentioned, this case was tabled in November. I'd like to note before we jump into the presentation that since November, the applicant has um, met with neighbors and has submitted a memo um, summarizing conversations to the council. Um, they're moving forward with the case as uh, was presented in November to the presentation you'll see tonight is the same information that was prepared for your packet in November. So this is a request to amend a portion of the Silverton Plan Development District on 5.88 acres of unaddressed property on Geyer Court. The current zoning is Silverton Plan Development District, or PDD. Silverton was established in 1987. This site is identified as Parcel H, and uh, it is designated for office and institutional uses. And a portion of Parcel H down at Evans Road and Cary Parkway is already developed for office uses. The applicant is proposing to rezone the northern portion of Parcel H to allow for townhomes. They propose the following changes um, go along with this rezoning, again to limit the use of townhomes with a maximum density of seven dwellings per acre. They're proposing to increase the community gathering space to 3,000 square feet with minimum accessible seating areas which will include decorative pavement, seating, low walls, planters, dog waste receptacles, landscape beds, and lawn area. <coughs> They're proposing to double the open space requirement from 500 square feet per unit to 1,000 square feet per unit. They're proposing setbacks from the community, uh, for the community gathering space and mailbox kiosks, um, bring, making sure that that area is set back from property line A, which is shown here. This is the property line that, that is adjacent to the Winbrook neighborhood to the northeast of the site. They're proposing to connect the sidewalk from Geyer Court to the site, um, specifying that each unit will have a single patio or deck, which would be located on the ground floor. Uh, again, proposing supplemental screening along property line A, which is the shared property line here. Um, limiting the access on Cary Parkway to a single ride in and ride out proposing a fence around the stormwater control device. They're also proposing architectural um, conditions associated with this rezoning. These include specifying that each unit will have a two-car garage. The units for um, each, each of the facades will be offset by at least one, one foot. Each unit within a cluster of townhomes will be architecturally diverse. Um, they've also noted that the end units will carry um, brick or stone facade materials along the length of the side wall on the first floor, and that will also be treated with landscaping. I'd like to also note that the applicant did submit tonight um, a packet which has some illustrative um, designs of what this may look like. Those, those plans are not submitted as uh, zoning conditions with this, um, so uh, the conditions that they are committing to are what you see in front of you and not necessarily the plans that you saw in that packet. When staff evaluated this case using the Imagine Carry Community Plan, the request was found to be applicable with policies that dealt with infill, type of housing, density, topography, potential loss of land for office space, and appropriate transitions. The future growth framework map designation for this site is traditional neighborhood and traditional neighborhoods are generally typified as large master plan communities with some degree of housing mix. They also provide for incidental and other use types such as neighborhood commercial and office located along the edges of residential areas. Cary Parkway is the dividing line between the traditional neighborhood and employment mixed use campus designation. There are significant uh, topography and other constraints associated with the site which impact the feasibility for office and other non-residential uses. You can see from this map the drop and grade towards the northern portion of the property is approximately 60 feet. There's also stream buffers which run along the northeastern portion of the property partially and partially bisecting the site. And the gray line that you see um, running along this northeastern portion is a sewer easement uh, that's existing on the site. These site constraints do have an impact on the development options for the property. Um, and they also add to the provisions for potential 
uh, transition between this site and the adjacent neighborhood to the northeast. Uh, the community input for the site included a um, neighborhood meeting, um, town council public hearing, and the planning and zoning board uh, public hearing. There were concerns expressed from the residents in the Winbrook neighborhood um, about potential traffic associated with this development, loss of land for office space, and impact to the streams and the buffers. This is a site where the staff uh, recommendation is for approval. This request is to change the designation of a portion of Parcel H in the Silverton PDD from office and institutional use to allow for townhomes. If this request is approved, it would represent a loss of land currently designated for office and institutional uses. However, um, you, looking at the future growth framework map, it does identify the site as traditional neighborhood, which also uh, notes that single family and townhomes is appropriate. Further, the concern for office at this location is somewhat mitigated by the size of the site. It's 5.88 acres, the challenging topography, and the off-street positioning of the site, meaning that it's not pulled up to the intersection. The staff also notes that the site, if it were to remain as office and institutional, this would also be supported by the Imagine Carry Community Plan. Being in the traditional neighborhood, being at the edge of the traditional neighborhood um, along the road, this would also be supportive for office and institutional uses. So either one would be supported by the plan. On balance, staff's analysis when looking at this particular request, um, we find that the request is generally consistent with Imagine Carry Community Plan, um, which is why we have the recommendation for approval. The Planning and Zoning Board um, heard and discussed this case and recommended denial by a vote of four to three and planning board chair, uh, Mark Evangelist is here to share the, that discussion. Thank you. I'm gonna work backwards a little bit. I'm gonna talk about the votes against <coughs> denial for the folks who thought the project should have gone forward. Um, their point was, this is prime office space in name only. It's been out there forever. No one's developing it as office space. There's unused office space that is developed nearby. It's just one of these deals where we can call this office space and let it be a big empty plot for the next 50 years, or we can call it something else and, and get something done with it. It's just not the prime office space. There, there, the topography doesn't lend to it. The road access, it just had that name. As you saw, the, the uh, plan designations can go one way or the other, so there's no super compelling identifier of this being office. It, uh, it is better, frankly, suited for townhomes than even any of the other residential uh, opportunities that might, might come from that area. That's the folks who, who are against denial. When I talk about folks who voted for denial, I'm gonna have to go a little inside baseball here just for a second. This was done in August of 2017, it came before us. Since that time, we've had some discussions about, shall we say, the identity of the Planning and Zoning Board. This is one of the cases that had me bring that question to you. Because there was, in the support for denial, a very strong fervor of, we are the defenders of office, dwindling office space in Cary. We are gonna hang on to office space with our last dying breath because there's so little of it and we just need to exercise every possible opportunity to, to vet that before we just go sling a few townhomes on it and declare victory. And that was one of the cases that really got me thinking that, that we needed some, some uh, more concrete direction. Since then, we've had that. Now, this is just me, Mark's personal opinion here, but under our new direction, if this case were to come to us today, I can't say we would get the same, I can't say we would get a different result, but I can't really tell you we would get the same result. Uh, I know I have to give you what we voted on back then, which I am doing, but I just wanna give you that little caveat because this was one of the cases that got us thinking about just how, uh, how we're thinking about our place in the, uh, in the community plan. So that's all I've got on this, any questions? Questions for Mr. Benjamin. Thank you. 
So after the Planning and Zoning Board meeting, the case was sent to Town Council and tabled in November of 2017. Um, and as you know, the applicant did hold a neighborhood meeting in February and is bringing the case back before you tonight, again, with no changes since um, when you saw it originally in November. This concludes staff's presentation. We're available for any questions. Questions from Ms. Fry? Comments? Motion? Make well, comments? Make comments? No. Any further comments? Go ahead. I was actually going to make a motion. If there was a second, I'd, then I'd speak to it. Okay. And then, then we could have discussion at that point. Okay. Um, I move to deny 17 REZ 12 and adopt the statement of inconsistency attached in the staff report. Is there a second? I'll second it for read. For okay. Discussion. Um, I first want to thank the applicant. I'm getting. I'm trying to deny his project, but I think he has done a yeoman's job in listening to the neighbors, um, the area community, and trying to craft a very a quality project. Um, he's can placed a number of conditions on it that ensure quality, um, that try to fit into the surrounding community, and in my honest opinion, would be a quality residential product. That said, I don't believe this site, I believe this site could better be utilized as it's currently zoned office or institutional. Last year or two years ago, I probably wouldn't have said that. But with the approval of the intergenerational Waltonwood projects, 200 units of assisted living, and another couple hundred units across the street, I believe this project or this property will become much more higher in demand for neighborhood medical office, um, legal offices, optometrists, dentists, and the like that might be looking for small parcels of land and not the big 20, 25 acre chunks that we typically see with class A prime office space. Um, in talking with a lot of the residents, um, they would love to have some more services in their area and the community. And then when I go up to the 30,000 foot level, let me actually say, if I was a resident of Winbrook, I'd probably prefer the townhomes because I believe it would be less of an impact. I believe traffic's less, noise is less, everything. I, if I was to be selfish and be a resident, I would, I would prefer the townhomes. But when I look at the 30,000 foot level and think about what is best for the community as a whole, now and into the future, to me it's still office. I might be proved wrong in five years from now, I, I don't know, but my gut says with the, those signature Walton Wood projects coming in, the other growth that's happening in the area, the apartments down on Evans and Weston and stuff, I think this really has the potential to become good neighborhood office and or medical services so that's how I'm looking at it okay other comments yeah I this was a tough one for me which is maybe a typical <laughs> Jack Smith 5149 <laughs> it's always been a little ironic that a townhome community doesn't want a townhome community next to them that's compatible and would rather have a more intense office use it's always been a stumbling block for me in thinking about this one and there's also some irony in that a lot of the neighbors have pointed out um, the Cary Community Plan, whereas the future great growth framework map in the Cary Community Plan calls for a traditional neighborhood, not office or employment center. Uh, I, gr I know everything's allowed in, in everything, I understand that, but traditional neighborhood is primarily residential. Uh, and they point out the 2040 plan and really it doesn't support, I don't think, what, what they say. Um, but I agree with Mr. France exactly on, on what he's talking about, the future office potential of this. And it boils down to me after I weed all the ironies out, do I go with the map that's in the 2040 plan or do I go with the opinions of the neighbors who are going to be living next to this for years to come? And which do I choose? And in this case, I choose the neighbors and the support of Mr. Francis' motion. Okay. Other comments? Well, um, if we're to look for this compelling reason to change what it was, I, I, I want to make a comment. I, I think if you do look at the 30,000 foot level, 
uh, Mr. France said, well, we I specifically asked the question on the hearings before we, or the public hearings and discussions before we adopted the Cary Community Plan, was every plot or every lot, it was every area that was colored a certain color, was it checked for topography or was it a 30,000 foot 2D view? And I was assured it was a 30,000 foot 2D view because they could not go out and survey all the streams and, and, and you know, and, and highs and lows. Um, therefore, I, I don't think to say the care community plan and this little spot of color on the map doesn't mean that that's what it was, it, it has to be that because I think with the topography, I think it would lend itself better to, to town homes and, and a great place to live. But I, I believe that, it, like Don said, I believe if I live there, I'd want to have town homes behind me and not an office building. Um, I did want to ask, are the, I, I kept hearing high density, high density, high density. I thought our de definition of medium density was five to eight or three to, what, where's, our, where's our medium density? Yeah, that, that's correct, um, five to eight, and they're proposing seven units. So per this has never been, con this, this is not high density, this is medium density. And in how many acres, and I, I should have asked this question a week ago, is it maybe in the staff report and I just skipped it, skipped over it, in the Winbrook subdivision, how many units per acre was that density? Um, I believe Winbrook is six dwellings per acre. Because it's it was quoted as being ninety one yeah, units. Six acre. dwellings per acre. Six dwellings. So it's higher than Winbrook, but it's uh, also there's all this buffer area that's is being eat up, and it's a smaller area. So it, uh, the usable land it may be just as dense, it'd be about the same. Um, so <coughs> it's getting closer to the. The 50.5 to the 49.5 in my mind uh, <laughs> as I go, but um, I, I, the, the, all these years not being not being used as commercial, um, I can see there's a change, and I appreciate what you're saying there, and and knowing that there needs to be services across the road, we can't dictate that, but we we just know that there possibly could be. Um, so. Stay on the fence here for a minute longer. <laughs> I sent him a note, 50.5, 49.5. You know, sadly, um, this is becoming the wave of the future. You know, you have P and Z with five to four votes, four to three votes. Uh, and the problem is, it's, it's, it's almost, a, sadly, it's, it's a nice problem to have. Great responsible applicants. These aren't out as, you know, these aren't, uh, you know, the West Coast uh, folks to come in and clear the land. We've got people that care. Um, they've listened to the community, um, make, the, make the adjustments, put the conditions in, same as the last, last one that we, we just tabled. And so it just, uh, I think this is our future as we look at the, the remaining land and the fact that a lot of this is similar to infill. Um, but Listening to Mark, it was interesting about, um, um, you know, it's been open for so long, but, but I think Mr. France said, and I was kind of leaning to stay that way, and I think the comments you made, you know, a lot of times when people come up, you know, are they, are they using the example because they really just don't want something next to them? You know, that happens. I mean, I'm just being candid. That's what happens a lot of times. But I felt uh, we heard some things tonight about uh, the need for that O and I, and I thought those uh, those arguments were genuine, and they, they kind of uh, are the, are the new wave. And based on uh, the developments around it, you know, I think that has the opportunity to start being a meaningful O and I space. And I think you you said it well. I, I will add, I attended the last neighborhood meeting they had, and the applicant did a good job of presenting project mm -hmm. and I at the end I got up and kind of gave them okay the reality is, is the land is going to develop one day it's going yeah. to so if you're just saying no because you're hoping nothing ever gets built don't hedge your bets and I tried to explain to them that this is what it could be as office you know you not as much as they could fit on the site and this is what it could be as residential you know which one do you prefer I believe
believe they got all the information they needed knowing that it ultimately can be built on one or will be built on one day and i think they genuinely want the services or the, in the community um, regarding the density comment it's the density is not really it, to me it comes down to use is it better as residential or is it better as office and i just believe it's better as office if it was 30 units or 50 units i don't know that would change my thinking whatsoever and then to the p and z the split vote i think we're going to see a lot more of those as time goes on just because like you said the infill and cases are getting more complicated and it's healthy because those yeah. are our citizens it is. They, we're, we're asking them to look at it from a different lens they don't have to worry about all the legal things we do and they struggle too you know and, and you know like again on these websites when you get these are our hand-picked people that's just so um, BS I mean people apply for these jobs these are citizens that do their they care about their community they put in applications and they go through rigorous interviewing uh, and part of that is to, I'm defending our PNZ now we, you know they go through a lot of um, scrutiny and we we appeal to them to just uh, you know vote as you through your eyes as the as the citizen and it, you know it's healthy to see that those votes are split too. So just it's just the future. So. Other comments? Or are we ready for a vote? We have a motion to deny. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Four to one for denial. All right. That concludes our agenda this evening. We have no closed session, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. There's a motion. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries unanimously, and we are adjourned.